this is, uh, for those of you not familiar with the format, we have, um, this is the colloquium, happens on Fridays. Uh, we invite people to give work in progress. Work in progress means that they're open to suggestion. Uh, work in progress are also, also means that we're kind to them because we understand it's a draft. Uh, but it's meant to be you know, text-based intensive discussion. Uh, we're very low in the formalities, basic introductions. This is Paul Worth, University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Um, one thing I would say is that you should really take a look at his last book. Uh, when did it come out? Uh, 2014. 14. Uh, which I think is actually one of, going to be one of the, sort of the reference points for future discussions of religion in empires. In this case, the uh, late, late Imperial Russia. Uh, well worth the read if you haven't read it already. And today he's presenting it to us the first chapter of a project which is really in the makings right now. This is the first chapter you have completed, is that right? Uh, I have six in draft. Six in draft? Yeah. 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 But draft, very much in draft. Okay. And, uh, and he'll tell you about it right now. Yeah, so, uh, right, well, thank you, first of all, um, for the invitation to be here. And second of all, to all of you who came out, I try to imagine getting my colleagues to come to anything on a Friday afternoon. In Las Vegas, it's virtually impossible. Uh, nobody's been on campus. Uh, let me make these four broad observations in introducing this particular piece. One is to talk about the project. One is to talk about the chapter specifically. A third thing is to talk about some of the challenges that I faced. And fourth is just to make a very, very small point um, about the uh, joy of doing this. Um, on the project itself, just over the course of doing a lot of the work that I've done primarily in the religious sphere, I've just sort of been convinced over and over again that the 1830s are uh, an extremely important period of time. Uh, it's a time of uh, kind of innovation and dynamism. Uh, it's a striking period in a lot of ways, and although there are still are, in essence, uh, sort of stereotypes of the age, the gendarme of Europe, and basically stagnation and so forth, uh, it's really a period of tremendous consequence. And so it seemed to me as though there were, in particular, a lot of things happening roughly in a four-year period or so, from 1836 to 39. a lot of very specific things that I could focus on. There is a word, quadrennium, uh, not very many people use it very often, and I thought to write a, word, write a book about a quadrennium, probably from a marketing standpoint, wouldn't do very well. And then you see all these yearbooks, you know, about like this year that changed the world, or the world is inconceivable without 1959, and so forth. And so I started to think, well, what would happen if I did a yearbook like this? And uh, because I was the chair of our department at the time, you have, in some sense, a lot of time to think about it, in the sense that you can't actually do anything, but you can sit a lot at your desk thinking about what you would like to be doing rather than what you're doing. And so I started to think about this, and instead of doing other things that I might have been doing, I started to just poke around with it. And so it seems to me that it, I came down on the conclusion that if I have had to choose a year, it would be 1837 in this process, and that the 1837 was a particularly important and pivotal year, I guess, for Russia entering the modern age, though I'm not sure if modernity is the term that I want to use. I would maybe cast it in terms of... Um, exaggerating a little bit, Russia became what it became because of 1837. And there's obviously some degree of exaggeration in all of this, needless to say. Uh, I'd like to be sort of playful and provocative in the good sense, and people can uh, criticize it accordingly. So what I've done is I've taken basically, in essence, 10 episodes or processes, sort of combinations of the two. Uh, these will make up the 10 chapters, and you have the first one in front of you. I'll just recount these very, very briefly. I should be able to remember them, but I have my cheat sheet here. Uh, the first is the one you have, basically this trip of the, uh, uh, of the heir to the throne, um, a trip of some 20,000 kilometers or so across various portions of, Europe, uh, of Russia. Uh, the second is the appearance, uh, actually beginning January 1st, 1838, of the provincial newspapers, but the decree creating them is, comes on June 7th, 1837. Uh, the opening of the first, or the opening of the first uh, uh, railway in Russia, happens in October of 1837. A line that connects uh, Saint Petersburg and Tsarskoye Selo. Uh, the creation in December of 1837 of the Ministry of State Property is also a critical moment. It seems to me in peasant reform and just reformist projects generally, a step towards emancipation in its own way. Although the uh, ministry had to do with uninserved populations. Uh, the fifth chapter has to do with basically. Um, an attempt to conquer the Khanate of Khiva, which actually occurred in 1839 to 40. It was a so-called winter campaign. It was an utter and complete disaster. Uh, it was a, a holocaust of camels, about which Alexander Morrison has written. But there were important preparations occurring in sort of 1836 to 37, attempts to solve this problem with Khiva short of an invasion. I can talk about the, what those problems were. Um, the sixth chapter has to do with the uh, uh, reunion of the Uniates, 
uh, with the orthodoxy. This happens in March of 1839, but in fact, the first, the very first legislative act of 1837, if you look at Polnay Sabranis, the first thing that happens on January 1st is the transfer of religious affairs from the Roman Catholic College, that is, unit religious affairs from the college to the uh, chief procurator of the Holy Synod. And so an important step is being taken in that process, which culminates then in 1839. Um, also, stretching 1837, the skin of 1837 a little bit back into the November of 1836, the 27th of November uh, specifically, we see the premiere of Glinka's Life for Azar in St. Petersburg. It happens, and that sort of unfolds also. It can be understood, I think, uh, Boris Kasparov is here, and can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there is a line of interpretation, I will suggest, that says that this becomes a sort of a foundational moment in Russian national music and so forth. And this can be contested, I think, but it's, uh, I hope to explore that. Um, the eighth chapter has to do with uh, Chedayak and his Apology of the Madman, which also appears in 1837. It allows me to go back to 1836 in the first philosophical letter. Uh, but the Apology comes in 1837. It might have been better if the letter itself had been in 1836. It was written in 1829, but in any event, it allows one to discuss that, sort of the appearance of the idea of backwardness and so forth, this philosophical foundation. And thanks to um, Nathaniel, we can also link it, I think, to moments in even the birth of ethnography and so forth, too. Um, ninth is the, ninth chapter is the principal reason why I chose 1837, and that was the, uh, the death of Pushkin, of course. Um, that was the obvious one. Um, and I guess elaboration of the cult of Pushkin in the aftermath of that. And the tenth was an extraordinary event that I was not even aware of, and that is that the Winter Palace basically burned down in 1837 and um, was reconstructed astonishingly in a matter of 15 months and opened a great fanfare uh, on Easter Sunday in 1839. And so the process of that kind of destruction uh, and reconstruction is that tenth chapter uh, about the sort of northern phoenix. Uh, the chapters, I'm designing them to be rather brief, sharp, tight, popularly written, if you will, kind of accessible, uh, mostly in the range of seven to 9,000 words. What you have before you is an obvious exception. It's too long. It's around 13,000 words presently. But it's also designed, I think, to be the longest chapter probably because it serves an introductory function. Uh, I'm not committed to the order being what it is there, but it does seem to me that in each case, logically, one can be built from the other. And they're sort of grouped in terms of sort of provinces, um, then empire, and then sort of culture with the fire coming near the end because it did happen on uh, the fire burned for about 36 hours between the 17th and 19th of December. Uh, I'll just note that the fire actually occurs, I think, within a, a long week of the heir returning to St. Petersburg. Returns back with his father, who had also been traveling extensively, and his mother too, for that matter, uh, and the palace burns down shortly thereafter. Uh, two operative titles right now. One is Quiet Revolution. I think I have this in the footnote, uh, Russian 1837. The other possibility is the year Pushkin died. So this chapter is the lead off. It's the introduction, as I suggested. Um, it's designed to introduce Russia, perhaps to those people who are not so familiar with it, not so familiar with those spaces. This will obviously be accompanied by uh, a map that my son has promised to draw, but never actually does. Uh, as I mentioned, it's too long presently. It's about 13,000 words, actually a bit more. I think it can be longer than some of the other ones, but my ideal is to make this book come in at around 90,000 words. That's brief and tight. Um, very readable, very accessible, perhaps adoptable in course settings, though I'm not sure how many people teach Russian history anymore. Um, uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular chapter, I really worked hard to try to give voices to the sources. Uh, in particular, the letters, uh, well, they're all letters, really, are co the core sources, the letters um, of the heir, of the emperor to some extent, and this Yurevich uh, who wrote to his wife. Uh, but also newspaper accounts, too, um, that are mostly based on Sevanay Pshala, but then were reprinted in uh, Litovsky Vesnik, uh, which I just happened to have access to and was able to use it in that setting. Um, I worry about the chapter being maybe a little bit too descriptive. On the other hand, I don't want to bash people over the head with theory conceptualization uh, and extensive and tedious analytical frameworks. The idea is to make it basically very readable, accessible. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, in terms of the challenges, really, of the whole project, I would say there's a fundamental tension that I see. And uh, one, I suppose, solution is to try to uh, resolve this tension. The other is simply to embrace it and live with it. Uh, on the one hand, I'm making, I guess, a set of claims about uh, a process of birth, if you will, or breakthrough, or departure, to some extent maybe rupture, but something new is coming into being, Russia as we know it, shall we say. 
So that's on the one hand. And the other hand, there's, I have a strong desire to create a kind of portrait, too, just to describe and show this place as it was, what it was like to be here, what it was like uh, to be given the task of founding a newspaper. What do you do? What do you put in it? Uh, of getting on a uh, train for the first time and, and writing about how uh, 40 miles an hour is a speed that's basically beyond your imagination for all intents and purposes, like literally not being able to fathom ever having moved that fast. Uh, so there's a, I'm trying to figure out how exactly to cast that balance. I don't want to overstate the case about rupture, breakthrough, departure, um, but I think it has to be part of, part of the story too. And that's why the two titles, Quiet Revolution is designed to capture that sort of, if you will, that paradox. On the one hand, quiet, um, it's not as though anybody sort of senses that something really big is happening, although there are some people who do write in that vein. Uh, revolution, perhaps an overstatement, but design, designed to capture that idea of fundamentally new things coming into being and change occurring. Uh, the year Pushkin died has the benefit of being uh, an extremely short, a forward title. I do like that. It's more agnostic on the, on the issue of change as such. Its emphasis, I suppose, is a bit more, at least implicitly, on por portraiture. It seems that could be interesting. So I'm not sure which is best. I'm still trying to resolve this. I would be curious to have your thoughts on this. Well, that's one big challenge. And the other, I suppose, which is related is audience. I'm trying to figure out who exactly I'm writing for. I'm trying to write in a, in a vein somewhat more popular than um, I have in the past. I think that's a real challenge. I think it's really interesting. I'm not sure if a book about 1837 in Russia is the, really the topic to do that with. Um, some of the books that are more popular tend to actually be longer rather than shorter. Uh, so literally just from the standpoint of even of just marketing and this kind of thing, I'm not sure exactly how to, how to cast it. People might say, oh, no, make it longer, make it more detailed. Uh, Others might say, keep it short and tight. My inclination is to really tend towards brevity if at all possible. I know you won't think so after having read this, I realize that, but to tend towards that, to have people at the end of the chapter wanting more and not saying this could have been shorter. Uh, but I guess it's maybe a larger issue that we all face to some extent is, you know, what is one's audience and how does one write for as broad a circle as peop of people as possible? I suppose not everybody's trying to do that, but it does seem to me that um, at certain stages maybe of a career or certain points, one would perhaps want to do that. So those are the fundamental uh, challenges that I face. And then finally, I would just make the point that it's just basically, so far it's been uh, an absolute hoot to write this book. It's just been great fun and one of the purposes of embracing the project was to compel myself to read broadly you know, about industry, about media, about um, Pushkin, about all these things. Um, not investing all of my efforts and energy in one particular thing but really kind of getting to know this place and understanding where these stories intersect and that's something that I'm still uh, working on and because it's only partially written, I, you know, I don't really don't really know how it will pan out, uh, but it's, it's been a real joy to write, I would say, and I've been able to write it more quickly. Uh, maybe the one other thing I should mention is that, for the most part, the book doesn't pretend to offer a great deal by way of new and original research. This is one that probably does m one chapter that does more of that than some of the others. If we take the death of Pushkin, I probably don't aspire to say anything fundamentally new. The originality resides in its juxtaposition with other stories that were happening simultaneously, such as the railway or the appearance of provincial newspapers or whatever. Maybe I'll stop there. You said five or 10 minutes. I've probably taken 11, uh, but it might be enough. Wonderful to start, yeah? Wonderful. Would, would you like me to call on people from some of the names? Or would uh, you do it sure, as, as, as you wish. Yeah. I know that probably makes sense because I don't know everybody here, uh, though Jamie reminded him of his name. Yes, right. Uh, Richard Workman. Okay. Well, of course, uh, this. Uh, is right down the alley. Yes, it is indeed, isn't it? So yeah. I guess it, I should start out. And I think uh, the idea is a great idea for the book, and I think this is a, a very good chapter to introduce it. Uh, and uh, because um, there never had been such a tour of the empire by a Tsarevich before. Yeah. Now, I, have a few, uh, I, I like your descriptions and your points, but I have a few uh, things that I think need to be filled in. Okay. And first of all, this is on page one, uh, the second paragraph, what you say about travels. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. here you say imperial <coughs> travels of this sort uh, were not entirely new. Well, uh, there are different types of imperial travels, sure and uh, the, uh, you're not writing about an imperial travel here. And, and it, uh, 
the czars in the 18th century uh, the, and the Tsarevichs were traveling abroad all the time. So this is not a, a novelty at all, okay. uh, and, and you shouldn't make it sound that way. Okay. Uh, now it is a novelty in terms of the Tsarevich's trip and the purpose of the trip that you uh, elaborate here. However, uh, this is not the first one of this kind. Uh -huh. uh, Nicholas I, mm -hmm. uh, in 1816, yeah. also did, uh, did this uh, for three months, not as long as, uh, as, as, as what you have. Uh, and it was, I think you have to give a sense of the kind of mentality mm -hmm. of those who were uh, designing the trip uh, and where, where it came from, because the whole thing was dominated by one figure uh, who was no longer alive, and that's the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna. Mm -hmm. She designed Alexander II's education. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, ruled in some way well, uh, over, the, uh, over the court uh, from the beginning of the century, and uh, Zhukovsky who she appointed Zhukovsky mm -hmm. head of it, right. and the tour in many respects was Zhukovsky's idea, mm -hmm. uh, and Maria Fyodorovna's notion was that the Tsarevich should learn about the empire, the very mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. keep coming up here, yeah. learn about the institutions, right. uh, the people, uh, the religion, uh, and she said to Nicholas I, don't pay much attention to the military. So mm -hmm. Nicholas went to the country and paid almost exclusive attention to the military. Simultaneously? Huh? No. Oh, I mean, in the, the earlier trip. Huh? You mean Nicholas in the earlier trip, in the trip that he took in 1816? Yeah. 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 I mean, all he cared about was the military. Yeah. You know, uh, he ignored her, of course, like many children ignore you know, their mothers. Yeah. So, the, uh, 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 so I think this has to be there, and this was also part of a larger movement influenced by the German poet uh, Arndt to train uh, the the, uh, the young people in the imperial fa in the, in the uh, Prussian family and other uh, a national ruler a national ruler mm -hmm. and to get to know the people uh, mm -hmm. and in other words to uh, uh, and, and to get out of the uh, out of the uh, capital so I think uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think you have to give a sense of the in the intellectual novelty of this yeah. in addition to the uh, physical uh, novelty and, and Nicholas himself himself uh, did travel around a lot the, in his reign. So, he did, so, yes. Yeah. So, of course, Alexander I did too. Yes, no. So traveling was not anything new. Yeah, I suppose that maybe if I could just interject, that's, I am fully, I am aware that this is uh, one of the mm, lacunae, I would say, basically, in terms of the work that I've been able to do to this point, and that paragraph, uh, which I see uh, written up quite extensively in your copy, yeah. uh, which reinforces the points that you're making, uh, that this was my sort of attempt to cobble it together for the purposes of the moment, but I... I, 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 had, I had that feeling, yeah. Uh, so, yes. At any rate, uh, that, that's the first thing. Uh, the second lacuna is, uh, um, uh, why is Moscow more or less left out? Because this is one of the central dramatic mm -hmm. moments where he met his family in Moscow mm -hmm. and saw the sights of Moscow yeah. and glorified the dynasty, you right. see, uh, and uh, Moscow, the heart of Russia and all of that. And I, I, I don't, it, you should, it, it should be a central uh, point in the, in the book, not, not omitted. Uh, the, uh, and uh, so, so I think, uh, I think uh, uh, that could be done. Uh, Sorry, was it central in the sources, Moscow? Uh, well, I was going to, uh, yeah, I would respond on that. If, if should I do that now? What would it be like? I'm just, uh, this is just a quick question. Yeah, uh, yeah because I there was, uh, in, in, I remember that in, in your in your book you had mentioned that basically the two central places that the heir visited were Novodevichirkask. Yes. Uh, for reasons that are, I basically dwell yeah, on yeah, briefly, yeah, yeah, and Moscow that. and Moscow is the other. And you you do identify those. Um, and I guess I would say maybe a couple of things. It's not clear to me necessarily why the uh, going to Siberia would be less important, because it seems to me that that actually is quite a central moment. It's the region that I think latches onto this with mm -hmm. uh, particular energy and enthusiasm, mm -hmm. uh, producing all kinds of, uh, well, I shouldn't say all kinds of, but a number of uh, forms of commemoration afterwards. Um, it, it seems as though it had an enormous impact there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, 
the first, so I, I would say that there is a way in which, in some ways, what's strange about this trip, at least in the sources that I've uncovered, is that there's really, and maybe I need to address this more directly, there's a way in which the trip basically is divided into two parts. If you look at, for example, even on the, um, uh, the images that were advertising this, this talk, you see that marshrut, this mm -hmm. itinerary. Yeah. And that really goes, in essence, as if I recall correctly, it goes basically to Moscow. And then, uh, then there's a second part of the trip where uh, the air accompanies, uh, uh, goes down to uh, Vaznesiansk, their military maneuvers, mm -hmm. travels with his father over to uh, Gelenjik. Mm -hmm. uh, his father goes down to the Caucasus. The original idea was actually to follow his father as well into the Caucasus. He also goes through, as Nicholas goes through also, the western provinces, Vilnius, Kaunas, Minsk, uh, and Kiev, and some other places. Uh, and then they visit a uh, Novocherkask, that event that you talked about, and then they come back to Moscow again, are there for a long time, and none of this is reflected in the itinerary. I know that they were there, mm. and it's not covered in the press in the mm. same manner. Mm. So I would say that in terms of the sources that I encountered, there is a way in which those earlier stages of the travel, mm -hmm. uh, basically from, well, if he leaves, I guess, what, early uh, May or so, uh, up until the point when he arrives in Moscow in August, and he's there for, I think, two, I want to say two weeks or so, which I think is the moment that you were pointing mm -hmm. to, which I think is, is, it's in the sources that I've seen, that Moscow moment is actually reflected less well mm. than some of these earlier moments, both in the archival record to the extent that I've been able to discover that, mm. and in terms of uh, the publication record or these, uh, the letters. In some ways, for example, Yurievich, um, he sort of stops when they get, in some ways he stops when they get to Moscow, it's sort of like our work is over, and I think he'd been, there for that part of the trip. So I guess the thing I would ask, what do I read to understand what was going on in Moscow? Well, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I mean, this is old stuff for me, so I don't, don't remember all of it. But, yeah. but there, were, uh, there were mentions of it, uh, as I recall, in the press, and then there was a book uh, written about his visit to the historical sites mm -hmm. in Moscow. I'll mm -hmm. send it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and and uh, it, uh, I'm, my thought is you might fit it into the section where you talk about sites. You yeah. See. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, and uh, it would uh, you know, fit in very well. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you need to make a central focus, uh, but that and the, and the uh, invocation of dynasty there yeah. uh, by, uh, by the, especially by the uh, the metropolitan, uh, I think, uh, is an important. No, this is very interesting because I was very, I was quite mindful of the fact that, in light of mm, the circumstance that you had identified Novocherkask and Moscow as being the central moments mm -hmm. in this trip, I was struck by how that had not revealed itself to be the case for me, and I was quite mindful of the fact that in some ways I was going sort of against your interpretation. I mean, it, particularly at this stage of the game, mm -hmm. it made me worry that I was, that I really was sort of missing something. And in some ways, I even tried to play up what I had even mm -hmm. to sort of fit, because I figured that you would see things that I had not. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't able to discern from the footnote, from the footnotes in your book, uh, what you had seen that had led you to that particular conclusion. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll so go, maybe you can, you can share I'll, that I'll with have me. To go back and re yeah, re yeah, re it. yeah. I mean, the, the issue is not that I'm uh, so much contesting, uh -huh. uh, but having followed, you know, having had the, uh, a couple, at least a couple of files in, in the archive there and those letters, part of the problem is that there are portions later in the trip where the father and the son are traveling together, so I lose those letters. Mm -hmm. Right? This is the problem. Because they're together, there's no correspondence. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, but I, I, I seem to remember that there was a, a, a dramatic meeting of Alexander with the Empress. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, yes. He and, wrote, and he this, rides out from the city, and I could. Yes, I could certainly include this. Yeah. Um, I was and thinking. He had missed his mother. And absolutely. The, and yes. Yes. No. Again, there is, and then the yeah. dynasty and all of yeah. that. Yeah. No, yeah. that is absolutely true. Yeah. And I had thought about ways to fit that in. I obviously have not done so, but I would certainly consider yeah. doing that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the third is a minor, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. minor point. And that is the, uh, the forms of uh, rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, that the crowd is used to describe yeah. the crowd's reaction. This is, this is now a, a pet issue of mine, yeah. and I deal with it in my, in my book, uh, my recent book, uh, so that Umilienia yeah. uh, becomes... A, so so I, I think this, this uh, requires a kind of, uh, I think, a, a sense of the dominant rhetoric uh, that's used by the circle 
around. Uh, Zhukovsky is certainly mm -hmm. one of the ones who brings it a sentimentalist, semi-religious, pseudo-religious mm -hmm. type of, uh, uh, of rhetoric to the mm -hmm. imperial family. Uh, and uh, so they're using this, and I think this would fit it in with the mentality of, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of those running the trip, because they were all uh, a, a tight little group. Yeah, sure. And then, then other, one, one other question then, which is even more minor, you, you use the term sweet to describe them sometimes. It, uh, Alexander and his sweet. Yeah. Is that used in the sources? Uh, uh, maybe I'm uh, Svita. I'm using, I'm, I'm sort of translating that, I think, basically. If, or, if they use Svita, yeah. that's all right. Yeah. Of course, that's not to be in, in, uh, confused with the imperial suite or the Tsarevich's suite, which is a military. I see. So I need to be mindful of the mind particular mind. term. Okay. Yeah. I might have been using that just as a shorthand. I mean, I certainly the Svita has certainly come up, I know, but I'm, I would have to double check to see how frequently it's used and whether and, or not and it's... And whether it's used in, in a military. Yeah. Sense. I was just trying to figure out what term to use to describe this collection of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the one I settled on, mm -hmm. um, for the moment anyway, and perhaps not without some um, problematic dimension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No, these are all, this is great. Great. Wonderful. Catherine, after you yeah, thanks. Mine kind of echo Richard's in a way, so I thought I would <coughs> raise my hand now and try to join the conversation. Um, uh, so, but before I get to that, um, something you raised in your remarks, because you were so nicely telling us about the whole project, I find 1837 a very intriguing year and an interesting choice. I really like the idea. Um, but I'm going to be mean and ask you, I mean, you told us in your comments uh, all these different things, and that um, something about Russia was conceived in these four years, or something like that. So, I wonder if, in the course of the discussion, you could tell a little, us a little bit more about what that is. I mean, what you expect, and what you expect the intersections might be, even in a speculative fashion. What what it is you think uh, is the Russia that's emerging from your many um, themes here. Um, and then to move to similar, I had a similar question, you know, upon reading the paper to Richards um, about the imperial visits in general, and just to uh, agree very much that this was really nothing new, except mm -hmm. that of course the specific content was new. Um, and m more or less every such visit through the 18th and 19th centuries had a lot of very profound political consequences. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wonder whether you intentionally don't want to deal with that, or because you're really staying very, at this point, in this mm -hmm. draft, you're very much staying on the level of rhetoric. And I wonder if you intend eventually to go beyond that. It sort of depends how the chapter will link up with other parts of your book. But when you say for example, let's yeah. do the, fam the famous visit of Catherine the Great yes, to right. uh, you know, the South. Of this, yes. What uh, Isabel de Madariaga described it, I think, yeah. it really beautifully before Shetland and Zorin, right? Uh, um, mm -hmm. The Viceroy of the South chapter. Um, clearly, that had a lot to do with the abolition of the headman at the incorporation of mm -hmm. Ukraine, all these things. There were very specific consequences. Um, uh, when Nicholas went to various provincial cities, it resulted in the replanning of the cities, you know, turning mm -hmm. the houses around, more stone houses, or organizing the streets. Um, so that is a level you don't actually mm -hmm. talk about. You're, 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 you're more or less on the level of image and rhetoric, which is really nice, you know, but I mm -hmm. just wonder if you want to go and see what's behind that, or what your reaction is to that. And then third thing, also the same as Richard, is about the rhetoric, which links up to this. Mm -hmm. And um, I also found uh, reading through this is extremely familiar. I mean, these Kubiarski Vedavosti, of course, are full of this kind of language. And Lisa's Sirn of Chila and Biblioteca de Stenia, of course, it, it is a certain type of discourse that's mm -hmm. very prevalent. And sometimes you seem a little bit to be taking it at face value, but it's a, it's actually, it's just a, a mode of presentation, but behind these visits, to return to the previous point, is often something very serious and transformative. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those are just some thoughts that you might want to mm -hmm. consider. You don't have to respond to everything. You don't even have, yeah. Yeah, no, well, uh, let me, uh, I'll maybe make a few points. They'll be far from adequate, I'm sure. 
Uh, one is that, uh, yeah, I can, I can see that I'm being, uh, hmm, how should I put it, confronted on the issue of the novelty, and I appreciate that, and I think it's true, and I will take my momentary refuge as, the, uh, as a scoundrel would in the proposition that uh, I simply haven't had the opportunity to this point basically to read as much about the earlier travel as I would like to. So in other words, some of this is sort of placeholding language, if you will, uh, but I do appreciate all the insights here because I, it was something that I was, when I was writing about the novelty, I was asking myself, and I just thought for the purposes of delivering this draft, I would take out the parenth parenthetical true question mark that I had around many of my own statements. <laughs> Uh, so this suggests that they need to be they need to be probed a bit more, and I appreciate that, and I'm perfectly happy to do that. Um, realizing, of course, that there's more work ahead even than I realized. Uh, in terms of well, let's see here, Red, well, maybe I'll go backwards. I suppose rhetoric in certain time, certain kinds, of, a certain type of discourse. Um, I yes, I I, uh, I do see what I do see what you mean, and I think um, I I haven't discovered a lot so far, at least in terms of what I've, in terms of the sources that I've seen. I suppose, how should I put it, the sources that I've seen have been in no small measure of a kind of, for lack of a better term, a kind of rhetorical character. It's been a lot of these kinds of accounts. I did try to provide some sense of, I'm not sure if it's quite political consequence, but in the case of, for example, Vyatka province and Tufrayev, uh in the case of some of the descriptions that we see occurring in archival sources. I was also struck by some accounts that were published only a good deal later that actually describe um, where, where and when, for example, one sees these huge crowds and one thinks, uh, you know, to what extent is this exaggerated, is the enthusiasm overstated, and yet these, I mean, these unpublished sources that are just designed letters, for example, that are designed for just a consumption of the, cons of the addressee they really do kind of confirm this sort of picture. And I guess maybe the question becomes, in part, maybe this is not quite what you were asking about, but it's the question I'll, I'll pose myself right now, is to what extent um, is that language just part of the air that people breathe at the time, and therefore it doesn't necessarily say really much of anything about anything? Uh, and to what extent does it actually reflect a, um, a, a real and existing set of sentiments or degree of enthusiasm? Well, I don't think I'd be so negative about yeah, it. I mean, yeah. you can, but you can work with it a bit more, yeah. I think. It's Fair enough. And that maybe leads to the issue of, well, let's see. Uh, well, in the matter of political consequences, uh, I mean, I, I try to draw out those where and when I've actually, I suppose, I've actually encountered them. Um, for example, uh, I mean, Susan will correct me if this was inaccurate, but the, the, the fact that Vladimir receives these special tax benefits, which seems very much to be a function, it appears to me, of, um, you know, this, of this visit, this particular instance, um, uh, or the kind of house cleaning that occurred in Vyatka province um, as well, and the kinds of efforts that are made, uh, and one can, I think, really appreciate them, the kinds of efforts that are made to determine, to, to ensure uh, the comfort and safety of, of the travel before before it actually occurs. Um, but he's also, I mean, it could be much longer term, right? I mean, he did do yes. some very important yeah. things in the early 1860s. So. Yeah, no, this, well, this would be, yeah, in some ways I think <laughs> this is, there, uh, I, I like this, this uh, because this is one of the issues that I've also sort of grappled with. One of the things that I, uh, when I proposed this uh, uh, to the publisher, Oxford, one of the uh, reports that came back was, and I don't, think, I don't think this is at odds with what you're saying, was very concerned about, in a sense, by tracing things too much forward into the future, there was a danger of kind of uh, closing off potential other avenues that existed, making it too almost deterministic. And so maybe under the influence of that particular critique, if you will, I was uh, reluctant, well certainly at this stage, I was reluctant to sort of trace these things forward. But I do think that, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, the conclusion that I, to the book that I originally envisioned, my fear is that it could be massive for exactly this reason, is to really trace out some of the consequences in exactly the way you're describing. I mean, thinking hard about what happens later in the history of Russia that it can be linked without straining things too much, can be linked back to these particular episodes and particular processes. And so that's something that I'll certainly be thinking about. And that really relates to the first question that you asked. Um, you know, what is the Russia that's emerging from all of this? I mean, in some ways, it's a matter, I suppose, and this 
chapter is probably not the best one for demonstrating that, but thinking, for example, about the railways. I mean, you know, the railway hadn't appeared in 1837, it would have appeared in 1838 then. In some ways, what difference does it make? But I guess the idea being that, I mean, that modern Russia is sort of inconceivable without its railways, and thinking about the, the, the tremendous network that appears out of that. So that's a case of something emerging, a, a musical tradition uh, emerging, although I think it's a very complicated issue, how exactly that occurs, and how even, for example, Life for Azar relates to Ruslan and, and Ludmila, different ways of interpreting that sort of musical trajectory. Uh, these are issues that I'm still basically grappling with, though I think, so I'm, basically the answer to the, to the questions, which are very good ones, inevitably is, is going to be limited, but um, these are things that I have been thinking about, but I don't think that I've uh, encountered material sufficient to be able to make sort of concrete statements as one would do in this. Why, why are you so concerned with the uh, sort of the physical existence of a year as opposed to saying, they're simply saying it's 1837, a lot of things that we know about happened, and it's a springboard to talk about things that go well beyond 1837. Oh, I think very much that's sort yeah. of my, that's very much my idea. In fact, um, uh, Jürgen Oster, Osterhommel has this. Uh, what, what, what was the issue? People do it with 1913 all the time. Well, that's very motivated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, and that's, yeah, and that's, of course, that's also, there's a type of book that's kind of like on the eve, like basically people standing yeah. on the eve of a precipice. We know it, they don't, you yeah. know, and so isn't it, isn't it kind of amusing to watch them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there, there is that kind of sense. But Jürgen Osterhammel in that massive uh, transformation of the world, he has a nice way of describing the 19th century generally and the way I'm sort of conceiving in some ways of this, year in the same way. Uh, so I'm not suggesting for a moment that, uh, you know, January 1st starts and then, uh, yeah. although for the unit question, there is that nice moment. Um, and the, the fire happens right, right at the end of the year as well. Uh, so, but I'm not, I'm not just trying to do that strictly, but Osterhammel has this idea because he says, when is the 19th century? He says, well, we can start in the 1760s, we can start in 1815, we can start at different points. When does it end? We can say the 1920s, we can say 1914. And so the way he puts it, I think, is he says, this is, so this is not a, a history uh, of a discrete and isolated century or period. It's rather a matter of situating the 19th century in a broader right. uh, mm, uh, uh, mm, stream of historical processes. And that's very much, it's in that latter sense that I'm uh, suggesting 1837. Think, so it's very much, in some ways, it's, in some ways, I don't want to say it's a marketing ploy, that's going too far, but there is that sort of, there's a, there's a deliberately provocative character, I think, to it, to casting it in those terms. Like someone will say, well, you think 1837 is so important, we'll see about that. Mm -hmm. And they pick up the book and, you know, maybe I'll convince mm -hmm. them, maybe I won't. But you don't need to. I mean, you're no, using no, it as an optic. And I wouldn't be labor about it. Wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't be labor it. All right. No, I have one minor point just. Yeah, all right. Uh, Interesting. In, in regard to the, uh, Sorry. the rhetoric. Uh, yeah. it, and, and that is, uh, it's not only a question of it's uh, merely a, 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 mess, a means of expression. Uh, and the question is, uh, to what degree is there a reality there? Yeah, I know, I, yeah. It's a question that sometimes the reality is shaped to ex uh, express, express yeah, understood. itself. In other words, to, to conform, to, to yeah. communicate. The, and and one, of the, one of the terms that's used, in addition to Milenia, uh, is an article on this by a Russian scholar, uh, Vostok. Uh, which yeah, is right. translated enthusiasm, but it really is close to rapture yeah, in its, yeah. in no, its have, meaning. Yeah, yeah. It's and, uh, and, and to which, what, if the population is expected to show it, you know. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 there's this uh, means of authority acting on, yeah. uh, on the... Yeah. If I could just answer briefly just on that particular point. I mean, that, I, I'm trying to think, what did I cut out, what did I leave in? Uh, I, well, I thought I made a point something along those lines, not you exactly did, the same did, point, yes, yes. where I suggested that I think the early newspaper reports were designed in part to educate people further down the line about what is it exactly that you're supposed to do. So if you don't show rapture, there's something wrong yeah, with well, you. You, you might expand that a little bit. All right, all right, yeah. Um, Susan Smith-Peter? Yeah, I really enjoyed reading this, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad that 1837 is, is getting the uh, attention that it deserves. Uh, from your overview at the beginning, I kind of started to think a little bit of the idea of the turning point that didn't turn. I mean, yeah. it could be made a little bit too uh, okay. fixed that way, but I do think that in 1837 there was a moment 
of trying to create a particular kind of modernization, an almost sort of 18th century modernization. It was very influenced by Smith and the idea of, of this transition from uh, an agrarian to a more capitalist society. Little Not, reforms, as you call yeah, them. Yeah, thank you. The yeah, yes, little, that's, little that's reforms. No, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and what yeah. that does is it it is based on. Nicholas the first idea that there will be a long period of conservative transformation mm -hmm. and he doesn't quite get that this is a moment of intense change mm -hmm. that's happening elsewhere but it's not completely uh, incomprehensible that he might think that there would be longer than there was because of course in many places many times mm -hmm. things did take longer so I do think that there would be it would be really useful to, to think about a little bit more mm -hmm. the ideas mm -hmm. that that are behind this like mm -hmm. uh, Arsenyev um, Arsenyev is a fascinating guy. He's one of the main yeah. Smithians there. Uh, and the sure. fact that he's choosing the objects of study is very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. he has played an important role in shaping yeah. this. And so I'd be really curious to hear a yeah. little bit more about what he writes in that. I've seen similar things that he's written. And one of the things that yeah. he's interested in is the creation of intellectual capital. Yeah. So he's particularly interested in how do ideas get created and, and spread. So mm -hmm. when he talks mm -hmm. about Kazan, province he's not just interested in in factories although as a smithian he's deeply interested but he's also interested in the university voluntary associations mm -hmm. and all of this sort of thing because it's, it's part of that process of going from rude manners to more cultured and polished manners in the sense that uh, Adam Smith talks mm -hmm. talks about it and um, I mean it, this is a really important year. It is a really important year. And I like the title, Quiet Revolution. I think mm -hmm. that that's better because the year Pushkin died works for all of us. But if you're talking yeah. about a popular, a this popular, you know, a broad, a broader broad audience, audience, audience yes. I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure. And, I, yeah. and it, the Quiet Revolution has an argument in it, which I, which I think is really interesting. And I'd like to, to see uh, more, more of this here. I mean, one thing I would mention is that, Richard, in your work, you've talked about how um, this trip was different because it was the first one that really showed the Tsarevich. Because before, there was a fear that he was sort of a rival. Right? He was a rival to the, the emperor. So there, there, I mean, the figure of the Zarevich mm -hmm. is in some ways what's different mm -hmm. uh, because he's not a rival, he's the beloved. He's the beloved not just of his father, but of the whole, of the whole nation, the whole empire. So that, yeah. that is something Absolutely. new. And so then if we think about this idea of the beloved and this kind of rapture of, of a, you know the Zarevich and the and the empire. It, it becomes pretty pretty interesting. It's it's a way through. So how how is this being changed? And uh, Nicholas I has some interesting things to say in this paper about how um, you know we're trying to change. We're trying to have these useful things, and then they just mess it up by tearing up that poor woman's sidewalk or yeah, whatever they did to him uh, to her. So uh, there there is something there about he wants this he wants this to spur change. Yeah. He doesn't think that it's going yeah. to create a revolution so that yeah. you do have the quiet. But then again, I think it would really benefit from yeah. having a discussion of, of you know, what was more discussion of what was the intent. Yeah. You know, what might have Nicholas I intent be? What might have uh, Arsenyev's intent have, have been? For, the, for, for this for, travel for this, for this travel. Yeah. Yeah. And especially because you have yeah. that uh, Arsenyev's outline, I think you yeah. could probably do more, because I would imagine there is something in there where he describes that. Anyway, there's been a lot written about Arsenyev and, and that yeah. would give you a, a better sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, this is great. Um, and uh, but, uh, maybe I'll answer with a couple of points. Well, uh, one is that. Uh, I'm sort of making an assumption, I'd be curious, uh, an assumption for the purposes of a draft paper, emphasis on draft, um, and I'd be curious to have your thoughts. Sort of my assumption, because Arsenyev was part of this group, that he was the most likely one to have uh, composed this, it was like, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. or whatever it was called, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I sort of, he composed similar things I would other assume, times. I sort of made so that I, assumption. So I think it makes a lot of Presumably sense. Presumably his hand that, was there, yeah. at least in yeah. some sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to describe, it actually, I mean, and it makes perfect sense in light of what you've written about, in light of what you just mm -hmm. said, a lot of it was precisely about, uh, about, precisely about ind industry mm -hmm. and, and trade, and this was a, a lot of it, and I remember there was this one, this poor place, the name of the town I can't recall, did I say this here? It was a town in uh, Vernoyes province that was, he was listed as basically 
um, uh, the most insignificant town in, uh, in of all, all insignificant towns in Barona's province. And I was just thinking about this poor place and you label them <laughs> in that in that fashion. Uh, so I, I think this idea and reading your book was was very enlightening in this regard. This idea of the little reforms and this idea of this kind of conservative change, where I had I. Uh, where I'd hoped and I've started to do this to address these in a, these questions in a little bit more detail is precisely in the chapter dealing with the railroad and industry. And what I do is in that chapter, what I try to do is to come back actually to precisely this chapter having come first to say basically to the, to the reader, uh, now dear reader, recall that uh, industry was part of the agenda, if you will, in the, mm. in the Zarevich's travel. Let's talk a little bit more, and just there's like a paragraph or two that describes in a little bit more detail some of the things that he saw and some of the things that were written by, if, we, if this was Arsenyev, then, then, then he, that he wrote basically by way of, in a sense, setting the stage for the particular process of industrial mm -hmm. development that's reflected mm -hmm. in the construction of the railroad. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in some ways the point that you're making is one that um, I think maybe uh, is, um, is glanced at here, here I'm pointing to this computer, the paper. Uh, but then is I, I at least have plans, and I have done it to an extent. Let's put it this way, mm -hmm. in its appropriate place, shall we say? So uh, that's just basically a confirmation that that seems to be um, uh, something to do, something that I should indeed be doing. Um, and I like this idea of a sort of a turning point that maybe didn't turn, or a, a moment where there was an opportunity. What I'll mention just by way of the title, and it's interesting to have your thoughts on that specifically, is that. Um, I, I do have an advanced contract with Oxford, and I had suggested for the purposes of signing that contract, the two titles. Uh, they did not like, or I should say one person, the person I'm working with did not like, the year Pushkin died. Didn't elaborate at great length about why, and because I literally had not written a word of the book, I had literally just written the book proposal, I thought to myself, I'm not going to worry about this too much now. But it's interesting to have your thoughts, and I'd be curious if someone goes to bat, you already did to some extent, uh, uh, and I think Angela, you as well. Uh, if I remember, uh, the year Pushkin died, but I, th I assume that her concern was precisely the one mm -hmm. that you're articulating. Mm -hmm. um, and then this idea that Tsarevich is traveler, I would maybe defer to others who have done more about traveling about, I mean, Richard, would you, the, the point that Susan just made about precisely the heir to the throne making this travel, yes. might that be emphasized folks, oh, yes. as a more... Very, as a, very much. As, yeah. a, as a novel. Yes. But, yeah. but nonetheless, Nicholas I, of course, he's not the heir at that point, right? That's right. Of course, yeah. 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 Interesting. All right, good. You know, I see that now, yeah. Nathaniel Knight? Uh, yeah, just, just following that, that point, it might be interesting to contrast uh, Nicholas's own travels in the empire in precisely this period, because uh, he's yeah. always traveling. You know, he mm -hmm. goes around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and actually, there's a, there's a wonderful description of his, uh, of his accident where he gets injured in uh, Beckendorf's uh, memoirs, which are as a, an appendix to yes. Schilder's. Um, yes, and so, no, I have so yeah. it. But, but, I, but I think that dynamic is very different, because when Nicholas comes around, you better watch out, you know. Mm -hmm. he's, he's Absolutely. Like, and, uh, and whereas, oh God, yes. you know, the, the air can, is just simply free and available as Absolutely. an object of, you yes. know, Love and expression, and, and the yeah. so it's a completely yeah. different kind of. Oh, the contrast, kind of yeah. Dynamic, and and yeah. that's something that we yes, want yes. to I, I, I love that kind of symmetry in the way it's set up between the, you, you've got Alexander studying Russia and Russia studying Alexander, mm. and both sides, and it's kind mm. of a, it's a story of, of knowledge, you know, sort of the, the management of knowledge on, on both sides. So I, I sort of echo um, Susan's comment about sort of. You know, trying to get at a little bit what is what is the underlying kind of agenda in terms of what Alexander is supposed to see you know, as he goes out to these places. You know, what what is what is he looking for? What does he want to see? What do his handlers think he should be seeing? Right. You know, and I think there's a big difference there. Yeah. Anybody can um, tell me more things about where I get that though. I mean that's yeah, the, it's not yeah. obvious to me where where I where I mean we've had some suggestions. Yeah. From yeah. the text. From the text. From the text itself. I think I think some of it too clever. Um, you know, fleshing out, I think this helps to flesh out a little bit what is it that really is is pivotal about this period, about, about this yeah. year, because yeah. I think there is, a, this is really a critical period in terms of the way, you know, understandings of knowledge mm -hmm. in, in the Russian Empire, the way knowledge is managed, sort of a professionalization of knowledge. I mean, another mm -hmm. point you could bring up is the creation of a whole set of different kinds of university chairs at this time, first chairs in Slavic studies are coming in precisely in 1837 of all of these uh, scholars who are being sent out traveling all throughout Europe. And, like this, this is when um, 
Well, Maximovich is in Kiev, but the guy who teaches Russian history in Moscow uh, is, is studying Berlin at this time. Uh, with, uh, with all sorts of you know, scholars have been sent abroad. They're studying and come back to university chairs in the 1840s. And of course, university education is, is revolutionized in the 1840s and, and professionalized. So a lot of that in this period. So there really is a sea change in terms of the way knowledge is being uh, understood, professionalized, and the fact that you know, Alexander is being sent out with Arsenyev, who is an extremely important person, mm -hmm. a statistician, you know, and and you know with this agenda to go out and learn about the empire, you know, is it, in some ways it's mm -hmm. a um, you know f really foreshadows a lot of this kind of uh, positivistic uh, sort of mm -hmm. ethos that you begin to see within the bureaucracy in the 1840s and and so forth, and mm -hmm. and so I think it, I think this 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 can be tied directly to. Uh, Alexander's trip in terms of the way, you know, the kinds of goals that are set for him and the and the way he's supposed to be. I get the impression when he yeah. really ordered his student was 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 meeting girls, but <laughs> but that's a whole different different end of it. Um, but but the other aspect of knowledge, of course, is the um, is the way that people respond to him. And uh, you know, I found it one. You know, he's going to all of these different places. Presumably, quite isolated places, um, and but yet somehow, if, you know, and it's apparent, it's not just the kind of official stories, but it's the the personal letters as well. Reflect there seems to be a kind of consistency in the way people respond to him, and so the question is where where how is this information uh, penetrating into these different regions? How do people know who this guy is and what they're supposed to do and and how you know and and so I think in terms of you know, circulation of knowledge into these more distant, isolated areas, um, you know, I think there's a, sort of, there's a story there as well yeah, in yeah. terms of how knowledge is, is penetrating. And I think your, your second chapter on the provincial newspapers sure, yeah. is, is going to speak to that, but, but I think there's probably a prehistory to that as well, because this you know, obviously can't be coming out of nowhere. There has to be some... Uh, Channels that are already existing that are spreading this kind of. Nathaniel wants you to do a lot more. Right? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. This is uh, this is all great. Uh, uh, um, and in some ways, I, you know, in, in terms of the points that you've just, uh, Susan, did you want to add something specifically on this? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted you. to add about sources. I happen yeah. to have just come back from London, where I was doing research in the Leaven Papers at the British Library, and there's a considerable body of sources there about this trip and also about Nicholas's trip to uh, Europe in 1816-1817. So it could be interesting to, to look at. Yeah, I'll just add immediately on that score, it's quite interesting that um, uh, Alexander II, I'm going to get the date here wrong probably, it was either 1838 or 1839, and Richard, you might know, he goes to London. Mm -hmm. uh, and he evidently charms people there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of the goal is, uh, uh, Britain and Russia are coming close to war in the 18, 18, actually right around 1837, there's actually a major sort of diplomatic uh, mm, mm, crisis involving this uh, boat called the Vixen in uh, the Black Sea, uh, which is addressed in the chapter on Hiva, uh, and a kind of the first Cold War and the birth of, Russia, of, of British Russia phobia. And he's sent there basically, I'm not sure if this was the purpose, but one of the things that happens is that he's actually able to charm, at least by the, the limited sources that I've seen, he actually, it, it, it amounts to or, be, or becomes at least a sort of charm offensive mm -hmm. that works actually quite well in Britain and becomes, as far as I can tell, and I haven't focused on this in great detail, but becomes, uh, you know, one of the sources of a rapprochement that basically then goes into the uh, early 1840s and is, I, I guess, really only disrupted as when we get the run-up to the, to the Crimean War. When all of that uh, Russophobia, the, the 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 stereotypes, are then reactivated because they're already been already been created in in the 1830s, which is another way of maybe linking to Nathaniel's point about um, uh, other travel that one could point to. I mean, there's another case where that uh, the um, the heir is the heir to the throne is going abroad, and the original plan Nathaniel was actually precisely to include the travel of the heir and the emperor who does this massive trip, well, I shouldn't say massive, but takes this you know, fairly substantial trip to Vilnius, Kaunas, uh, Minsk, Kiev, down to Voznesensk, and then goes to the Caucasus. And he's the first, as far as I know, I think, aside from Peter, the great, and so, many, so much of this goes back to Peter the Great, it's really quite remarkable. 
but he's the first uh, to visit, the, certainly the first czar to visit these places that have only been recently annexed in the first part of the 19th century. And so that actually was part of the original plan, but I, and, the, and the empress actually travels, there's just a passing reference to her going to Riazan, but she also does a bit of travel on her own, not quite as extensive as either her husband or her son, but she's, there's this moment when basically the entire family, for all intents and purposes, and there are, there are um, other grand princes and uh, grand duchesses who are traveling as well. I can't even keep track of it all. Uh, and so the, the, the table there was designed to actually originally just to link where the heir sort of intersected with at least his parents, and that's only part of the... So there's so much more that could be told in that regard, and I even thought writing this that one could quite literally write a book about Imperial travels in 1837, and if one included all of these things, mm -hmm. it could be uh, enormously uh, re revealing. Just a, a tiny aside related to the fire in the Winter Palace. Minsk, for example, I had no idea, practically burned down almost entirely in 1835. And this was one of the things that was called to, I guess he couldn't avoid seeing it, the emperor, when he goes to Minsk in 1835, he sees this. So there are all kinds of things in the empire and that could be linked to this. I guess it was, in part, I had started, I started to write this material about um, the emperor, still I would say, and the empress for, for that matter, uh, it seemed as though the material about the air that I've encountered is just so much richer and so much more detailed, and it seems like it made much more of an impression. Um, but I think the contrast that you're drawing is absolutely correct between uh, I think many people, having been visited by the emperor, were very pleased to be visited by the heir in light of the emperor's character, uh, one can say. And there's this one moment I had to take it out even to try to shorten what I had here. There's this moment when Nicholas says, uh, when the heir arrives in Moscow, under, or anywhere, I guess, for this matter, under no circumstances shall priests come out and greet the heir with the cross. Because as I understand it, if the priest comes out with the cross, the, uh, the, even the emperor must stop and must kiss the cross. And what had happened was when he had broken his collarbone yeah. in Penza province, he had been basically stuck in this place for two hours, had become increasingly agitated and irritated. And then when they finally gave him the okay to go to Moscow, he was arriving, his arm propped up on a pillow, and he had had to stop at every single church <laughs> coming in. And so he was absolutely determined that I had that original, in the original draft, and I took it out and just thought, it's just too many words to make this one point. But the contrast actually is quite nice. Maybe I should put it back in. Uh, what you're talking about, all this, the issues of knowledge and so forth, I mean, this is something that I think Susan also, I mean, I think the provincial newspapers and getting to know provincial Russia, if you will, I mean, you mentioned statistical uh, committees and ethnographic knowledge, and these are all things that could be written about and they will be ad addressed, but probably briefly, in order to focus, to say, here is one element that is the provincial newspapers upon which I'd like to concentrate, which is not to say there couldn't be a lot more that could be said. So I would take what you said, which basically amounts to two or three paragraphs, and probably just do that uh, and see what see what happens. Though I, I I don't deny you're absolutely absolutely correct. These are all these are all true things that would have to be included. Uh, Faithless. Can I say actually somewhat on this point? I, I wonder if one way of getting back to that question of the performance of, of devotion and what it means is actually precisely getting into that information circulation. Because as I was reading, I was thinking of um, you know, give us these little vignettes like the the Muslims praising Allah and the sort of local appropriation of these relics of these trips. And as I was reading, I was thinking of this um, book by Daniel Unowski on the Habsburg tour, royal mm -hmm. tours and celebrations. Um, and there's a really nice chapter about one of the Habsburgs. I think it's Frantio, so I forget whom. But he shows in that chapter how local populations are getting messages about what kind of performances they're supposed to give, mm -hmm. but they're also um, giving their, inputting their own ideas and sort of appropriating, right, their, the symbols for their own purposes. And so as I read, I was wondering if part of what you were trying to argue that is particular about this year and this tour is that people are um, sort of taking this as an opportunity, thanks to the railroads, thanks to the press, to sort of make the empire from below. Mm -hmm. And at times I thought you were gesturing in that direction, but the argument didn't quite go there. So I don't know. I mean, do you, want to go there? Do you not want to go there? Can you, can you say more about that? No, very interesting. Uh, and the, the, I mean, the comparative dimension, I think, is really, uh, really quite interesting. And I, uh, I agree that, um, I mean, this idea of cir information circulation, I think, is a really interesting idea. Uh, uh, once again, for me, it's primarily a matter of, I mean, I was hoping to get 
more of a sense, particularly from archival sources about, sources about how exactly, or at least gestures towards, indications uh, as to how, um, how these kinds of messages, as you put it, how people might get these and how might they might understand, okay, here's what we're, what we're supposed to do. And um, I didn't get a, a great deal of that. And so I wonder you know, how much of it is basically oral. In some cases, I mean, for example, if I understand correctly, I mean, a, a city like Tver really gets put on the, I mean, it gets put on the agenda and they're informed like, you know, the air is coming, you know, in 48 hours, or something like this. <laughs> Uh, and this was because, as Nathaniel knows, we corresponded about this, that Volodya was originally on, actually Arkhangels was too, for that matter, but Volodya was originally on the plan, and the, uh, and the governor there was just, there's, we cannot, you know, we, we basically cannot ensure safe passage, there's just too much snow. And this is really quite striking, you talk about climate change, these people writing about how it's, you know, late April, and there is not a sign of spring. Uh, you wonder about this, and like, the, the ice breaking on these rivers, like, you know, even in a normal statistical year, like basically on you know, April 29th or something like this, uh, there really are these, uh, these, these issues. But the point is that Tver gets on the agenda, as far as I can tell, or on the itinerary very, very late. Um, and yet they do still spring into action. And this is a very, it is an interesting, it's an interesting question. How exactly do people even know theoretically what to do? The idea of the opportunity to make the empire from below um, very interesting. I think, with regard to provincial newspapers, I would say absolutely. It seems to me that, well, I'll put it this way. I think an opportunity appears. Some uh, are willing to take it. Some are able to take it. What's striking about the newspapers, and maybe, Susan, you'll agree, I don't know, is actually I'm struck by how incredibly different and diverse they are. Mm. Like, there's some, some people or some of the newspapers latch onto this opportunity. It's almost like they were, like, just on the leash just they were waiting for this moment mm -hmm. and others saying like Jesus I mean our 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 printing press is in in dire shape we we don't have enough money to buy the paper uh, we don't have anybody who can actually edit a newspaper we have no idea what to put in the newspaper <laughs> like what exactly do we put in it uh, and so there's this entire range and so some of the papers they get the they get the official part out but they have nothing in the unofficial section for a number of years until they start saying, hey, we can just reprint these articles from the other ones. Mm -hmm. And there's this actually tremendous, this is actually an interesting thing that I didn't realize is that there's a tremendous exchange of these newspapers, right. that they were, the official section at least was to be exchanged all the way across the board. And they were to send it to all provinces, even those who didn't have those mm -hmm. newspapers. So there, I think there's a real opportunity. And uh, I think I'm, I hadn't put it in exactly those terms although probably pretty close, about the newspapers as being this opportunity for people at a minimum to identify, to in invest the content of their own provinces, uh, to create content for their own provinces, shall we say. Um, and maybe, how did you put it, to make the empire from below, I, I think there is that opportunity uh, appearing, and I think that's a very, very important moment. Whether, whether or not, or the extent to which that's true of this particular episode, that is the travel, I think is more difficult to say in part because I think maybe there is a kind of script having to do with raptures and all the rest that people are expected to follow and they do follow to one degree or another, whether it's you know putting on the harnesses on their own faces so that they can pull the horses or whatever it is that, that they do. But this is an interesting idea to think about with uh, in the future, yeah. Just may I make a footnote to that, Heidi, yeah. about the Tversky um, Vedomacy. It yeah. depends a lot on the editor. Absolutely. I mean, it completely, the, the one figure can make or break Absolutely. them. Absolutely. You know, some of them for five years, it's what, you know, Melnikov wrote all the articles himself. Yeah. And, and that's what makes them lively. Harrison was Absolutely. the editor of the Vavka Vedomacy. Absolutely. You know, uh, contrary to the way he makes it sound in his mm -hmm. memoirs. Yeah, yeah. No, and there and, and there are places that, that say this. I mean, Petr Zavod says we can't we can't get people to come up here. There's basically we, we don't have subsidies for their salaries, so we just do not have the people able to do this. The Orenburg Frontier Commission, on a different matter, is writing the same thing. As soon as we tell people what we're going to pay them, they say, "No thanks, I'll not take that job." I mean, it's really. But but whereas they're giving people in Astrakhan bonuses for serving in that place, this is what we need as well. So no, I agree entirely. It was that people were the first to? I mean, a lot of people locally were the first to admit. Um, even in the case, if you take the case of Vyatka 
and um, uh, Herzen, if one can believe Herzen, and it's interesting, quite interesting indeed to compare what he says at the time and what he says afterwards because they're quite, quite different, but in the memoirs, if one can believe it, you know, the governor has no idea what to do with the exhibition. You know, how do I make it? What am I supposed to put in this thing? And Herzen gets the job. But again, one doesn't really know. On the other hand, Shufayev basically gets canned, so maybe it's not so surprising. But I, I, I agree very much, yeah. Did you want to introduce yourself? I, yeah, yes. Uh, Lisa Reichlin, a uh, research PhD from Georgetown. Um, I had a question about foreigners' accounts of Russia in 1837 because mm. there's so many being written at this time. Yeah. Uh, travelers going yeah, exactly. in the in the second half of the 1830s. There's English accounts, French yeah. accounts, and how did they register Russia in 1837 versus 1836, 1838, 1839? And just how did they see Russia? Yeah. Did, did they notice any kind of change? Uh, I'm going to be straight up forward and honest with you. That's not a particular source that I've investigated or had, uh, to be perfectly honest, with the possible of s exception of de Custine for a slightly later period. And I'll address that here in a moment. Um, that's not a source that I had thought actually of, um, although I fault myself for not having done so now. Uh, and so if you have particular references, I'd be happy to have those. And with regard to Christine, it was interesting when I pre presented this idea uh, in Petersburg back in December, whenever it was, um, there was one of the reactions I thought was interesting and I hadn't thought about it and I haven't had the chance really to think through it you, because the reading that, that they were getting from the way I described the project in, on the whole, and I think maybe it emerges here from the description, less so from this chapter perhaps specifically, was that they were reading mine as kind of like almost a, uh, a positive response on behalf of Russia, a brief, if you will, in response to Kustin. And I hadn't thought about it in those ways, but talking about the dyna dynamism and, the, and the, the, the elements of change and so forth. And so I, one of the ways I thought about concluding might be to sort of juxtapose the findings of this, mm, uh, this research, this project, and maybe starting, for example, the conclusion with uh, de Custine and thinking about that juxtaposition. But foreigners' accounts is something that, um, uh, maybe there were a couple that I've come across, um, but it's not a, a, a source type, let's put it this way, that I've mined yet. Um, and uh, I need to. I think it could be very interesting. I think it could be very interesting. Just that outside perspective. I think, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, no, very interesting. But it's mm, just yeah. uh, Okay, about the year uh, 1837 first, yeah. uh, Mandelstam could offer you a nice emblem because in mm. concert at the railroad station, he alludes to Pushkin's death and the uh, first train taking off okay. uh, and cast it into a symbol of the spirit of music flying away and giving way to the approaching Iron Age. All right, so, so my idea had already been articulated earlier, as I can see. All right. Here I was thinking I was original. Uh, okay, but no, but no, no, very interesting. On the death of Rivo's note about the ceremonial trip, which of course is different from just, tra uh, just traveling the, the Tsars, uh, traveling in different, uh, to different places, as has been noted. Um, there is, um, what strikes me in your description is the uh, richness of literary background of the mm -hmm. impressions uh, that were recorded uh, there. And, uh, well, the reference to Gogol, uh, the, so you, you, you will find the revisor types there, yeah. the types, you know. Yeah. Uh, and um, the, uh, particularly Pushkin, uh, the provincial bow, uh, cast in terms of Evgeny Onegin, the, there is no, uh, you, you can find even two beautiful women there, you know, it's, it's just taken from the first chapter of, uh, of Evgeny Onegin. Uh, and the, even the itinerary of the uh, Evgeny Onegin travelogue uh, is, is remembered as Odessa, it is Nizhny Novgorod Yarmulke, um, and uh, this uh, this kind of thing. So, what what does it particularly mean? Is that 
uh, this literariness uh, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sign of the time. It is not simply about knowledge of, uh, and, and education, <coughs> but it is of this individuated education. When the, the, uh, the, the uh, Tsarevich receives, Tsarevich uh, is uh, receiving his building, so, mm -hmm. so to say, not simply acquiring knowledge, but it is, it is the experience of building. It's mm -hmm. kind of building travel. Uh, 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 in this sense, and uh, and this is uh, very characteristic to the to the epoch, to the time, yeah. uh, to the time. I mean. Well, and the last footnote: uh, there is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable part of the itinerary is connected to Pugachev places. Is there any significance in that? Uh, uh, this, uh, this. Yeah. No, interesting. Okay, yeah, no, this is a number of interesting points here. I'll start with the last one uh, uh, on the itinerary. Um, yeah, this has been some frustration to me to try to understand why, I, I don't, and I don't have the answer, why, why these particular places were, were selected. Um, there's just, and even, you know, even the Arsenyev, if, if we can attribute it to Arsenyev, even, even that account, uh, it, it doesn't, well, certainly not explicitly, um, it really just kind of goes kind of step by step. You know, it literally says, you know, 29 kilometers out, here's what you find, here's what you find. I mean, it just kind of describes. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see, like there's this one line, oh, where was it? Um, I mean, some of them are, they're so laconic. Like there's this one for Simbirsk, I think it said basically, um, um, uh, like something, something like this, Simbirsk, this was the description. Um, so muddy that you definitely need sidewalks. Foreigner Finkel. Like that's it. I mean, it's just it, like, is it is house? Is there, I mean, like, you literally have no idea what, and in some cases, it's, it's a little bit more elaborate, but it's not as though it gives any, like, really serious clues. I would say that it does seem to me, in line, I think, Susan, with what you've written about and what you were talking about, it does, I'm struck at how prominent, actually, indus, trade and industry really are in this. I think it's really quite striking. May I put another yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is no, no, okay? please. I, you just said you just put your finger on it, I think, because actually having it, it personally traveled to a bunch of those places, yeah. the reason yeah. was to see where sites of industry. Yeah. Um, and so that's why Pern, Kungur, Yekaterinburg. Absolutely. And um, Nishni Tagil is the one. Yeah. Tagil, is which really the one that. We also went. Yeah. I, I have yeah. to. Yeah. I mean, how, yeah. many, how many people in this room have been to Nishni <laughs> <laughs> um, And, you know, there's a factory museum there right. and so on. And these are sites of. of 18th century iron production, absolutely. so it's not Pugachev, it's industry. That, that's, that's my sense, I mean, if I think, uh, it's, at least for regions, I think it's absolutely the case, and actually Mission Tag Tagil is really, is really, quite honestly, the test case. Because as far as I can tell, the movement is kind of like, you know, you sort of go uh, down to Novgorod, and then kind of, here, I'm doing it backwards for you, sorry. You, uh, you go down, and then you go over to the east, and then you come around basically down to the south and back to Moscow, and then there's a sort of second leg of the trip that I described. At Nizhny Tagil, it basically you just go off. I think it's 150 kilometers or so. Does that sound about right from Ekaterinburg to Nizhny yeah, Tagil? It's not that far. You, it goes mm -hmm. out and back. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. a couple of places where that happens. Mm -hmm. It's not on the itinerary, so it just basically you out and you and you go back. Mm -hmm. And you definitely visit those places. And I'll mention, by the way, that Nizhny Ta Tagil actually is the place where, if one were to be, mm, uh, how should I put it, Stroga uh, Gavriya, that is uh, really being precise, you could say the first railway actually is there. It's a three kilometer railway that's actually used there. What's interesting is that, um, as far as I could tell, the air has nothing to say about it, which is quite interesting given the fact that the railway is being constructed at that same time, back in Petersburg to Tsarsky Silo. It was remarkable, yeah. That evidently was not remarkable, and yet he did seem, well at least, I think he was supposed to demonstrate an interest in industry, and to the extent that he was supposed to, he did indeed. The degree of his actual interest in these things, I think, is much harder you know, to, to tell. I mean, uh, on the other hand, um, who can get excited about different kinds of nails? Uh, it's an interesting thing. Adam Smith. Adam Smith. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess the uh, no, I find different kinds of nails to be fascinating, and if I basically, if I had chosen another career, it probably would have been in that area. But uh, yeah, nail making. Yeah, nail making. Yeah. Uh, uh, You'd have to have five other people yeah. working on it with you. Yeah. No, actually, good point. I hadn't thought about the connection between pins and nails and mm -hmm. Adam Smith. That's a very interesting observation. But I do think that industry is part of it. I think in the case of um, in the case of 
Orenburg, I'm a, I would assume that there was a, a desire to have some sense for this step and this area. Uh, I can't help thinking about how, and this is what I have not been able to isolate, when the decision to engage in the campaign against Hiva was launched from Orenburg, when that was taken, but surely, uh, I mean, Perovsky, who was the general governor there, definitely knew about it at that time. He had been agitating for it for a number of years. Whether or not he'd gotten the green light at that point is hard to say, but I suspect that there was something there too about a kind of, there was a military geopolitical dimension to that particular uh, visitation. And also just, I think, to see to some degree the ethnic diversity uh, because that's just an extraordinary group of people that you encounter, that you encounter there. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, why, for example, the, uh, the air doesn't go further west? Smolensk is as far as he, as he goes. Doesn't visit, for example, anything sort of Polish-Lithuanian, nothing Baltic. Um, a bit in eastern Ukraine, uh, I, guess, I guess he goes as far as Kiev. Why he doesn't go with the emperor, for example, to the Caucasus? Maybe it's just considered too dangerous? I don't know. Uh, but there are, there are a number of things that he certainly could have done and doesn't do, and it's not clear. Uh, that's a source of some frustration as to why, you know, why, he, why one can speculate about some of this. Uh, Angela, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, yeah. Anna. Yeah, just... Um, yeah, Anna, one. sorry. No, that's fine. It's fine. Um, I work on literature, this yeah, period, yeah. not history, and the one thing that struck me um, was this, the thought of the Tsarevich, like, looking at nails, looking at, you know, factories, yeah. whatever he's doing, it sounds like those memes of Kim Jong-un watching things be produced. Kim wow. Jong-un looking at glue. Kim Jong-un <laughs> looking at, at paints, you know, that, that over and over again, because it's this sort of, his, his connection, not just with, with surveying in, in general, but with the very material objects that are being produced. And I was yeah. wondering whether yeah. hmm. in the earlier rulers' trips, yeah. were they staring at material objects like that? Or was this a new thing? Because also in the fiction of this decade, the provinces are very strongly associated with a kind of dense materiality. Um, you know, it's all about stuff. All about stuff and that, that needs to be kind of enlivened and used and, and um, kind of brought to life. So I just wondered if that was new or if they always went around looking at nails uh, in factories. I, probably other people, probably Richard first and foremost, can probably answer that better than I can. I would, if I were to speculate, if we're put on the spot, yeah. I would imagine that that degree of materiality, as you put it, and mm -hmm. um, which I think aligns with exactly the point you're making about the ways in which the provinces are being perceived at this particular time, yeah. if I understand you correctly, yeah. it would seem as though, and in line with what Susan has written about uh, the sort of Smithian project and, uh, and uh, the promotion of industry and trade, it, it would seem as though this would be a particular attribute of this time. I don't know, Rich, Richard, would you have, or anybody else who's... I, I don't have any, any particular sense of that, but it sounds like a very interesting avenue of approach. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. And the other thing I would just... Yeah. One other thing I would add is that the way that these places are represented in fiction is so different from the way that they're represented um, yes. in these historical texts. I mean, the fictional texts are all about how these places are uh, a meaningless void. Yes. And there's yes. nothing there. And yes. also, the, you yes. know how you were actually surprised to read that the balls were actually okay. Because yeah. in fiction, yeah. they're just an opportunity to stage the ineptitude of these provincial yeah. losers yeah. over yeah. and over again. Yeah, that sounds yeah. Like yeah it's, a mix, it's a mixed bag, but some of them come off yeah. uh, pretty well. You collect some female top knots and throw them in a room, and it actually turns out okay. Right. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's obviously there's a, there's a condescending attitude in some of these, and when they're called earnest, but no, there's a real, there actually is a real enthusiasm for them, and um, I think there's a real recognition. There is, in part, I think, a recognition of that they can't be on the level, maybe, of, of, of the mm -hmm. capitals, but nonetheless, that they're really, many of them, some of them, at any rate, are really quite successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, uh, just uh, this footnote to this, uh, I think it, w it may have been uh, Nik uh, the uh, Tsarevich Nikolai uh, Alexandrovich, but there's a description of the uh, heir going to the towns, and it, for each of the towns, the, uh, all of the mothers Consider, were, were waiting for the Tsar with the expectation that their daughter would be his Children. spouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, of course, at the stage, this is completely absurd and illegal, you know. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> but this kind of psychosis uh, uh, grew up in the town. Uh, I, ha I, have, I have one suggestion that you're yeah. not going to like at all. Mm. Well, I'm I, waiting for it. I have to, I have to hear uh, it first. Well, prepare yourself. Okay. okay. Yeah, no. I think this chapter is too short. <laughs> With all of these, uh, all of these uh, no. uh, things no. that have come up, I love it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's good as it is, but it lacks a certain amount of uh, depth that have, that has have, come out in your own st statements and enthusiasms, because you, you seem to be taking a vow of description here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Hemingway. Uh, uh, but I think uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, a lot of the flesh. I mean, you have some of it here. Yeah. But the, uh, this, and, and this would lead into the chapters as we heard on the economy, on the provincial journals. Uh, but uh, yeah, all of that c could be brought in, and some of the things. So I would think. You know, the, th the thought of, 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 of preparing this for a, a basically uh, um, theoretical popular audience, which it may or may not uh, uh, reach, I mean, this is your, your decision, yeah. but I think you should, you, it's a good chapter. Yeah. You could make it a, a really good chapter if you, uh, if you would put more in it. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I mean, to add added dimensions to it? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I wonder. I, yeah, hmm. I wonder if there are, w are ways I could perhaps more deliberately, deliberately uh, gesture towards what's to come subsequently in the book. Mm -hmm. Precisely, that was kind of the idea, and there's a bit of that, I guess. Uh, a lot of it is basically backward-looking when we get to that, I, and that was what I, I, I've taken some things out of this chapter and inserted them in the subsequent chapters with the backward glance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not opposed to the chapter being, I, I've accepted the proposition that this chapter probably needs to be longer than all the others. Um, so I like the suggest. Well, I like the suggestion in the sense that you think that there's actually more to be said in the good sense. Uh, I'm worried in exactly the ways you predicted in the sense that uh, 13,000 words is a fairly long chapter and it's probably more like 13 and a half or maybe even closer to 14. It's a fairly long chapter already to begin with. So obviously there are places it could be cut without losing anything of substance. Probably there are more quotes than there need to be, and I'm trying to choose the best ones. But uh, I, I just wonder about uh, you know, uh, people's attention spans for dealing with the, any one particular chapter, and that would be maybe my concern. I, mean, I don't know if you want to address this particular point or something. Uh, it would, ben, ben, was it? Ben? Brent. Brent. Well, I have a uh, potential throwaway suggestion for this, and right. something else I want to ask you about. Uh, the potential throwaway suggestion is, can you artificially break it down into the, Tsar, the Tsarevich meets Russia as one chapter and Russia meets the Tsarevich as another chapter? Because that might allow you to keep them manageable and focus on less attention. Maybe not. I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of if you're very concerned about how, how large it is. Um, yeah, okay. And I have another question, which if you want to, I mean, I can, I can give now or I can give later. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess maybe is there, you want to, did you want to say something on this particular line of discussion that was going on yeah, right now? Yeah, just this exact thing. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things you could do is if you're, if you turn this into a less descriptive chapter and one that's more uh, following a series of ideas or propositions, I think some of the things you could do would be pairing back some of the description. Because one of the things for a popular audience that's interesting, it's just seeing how a mind moves, right? And here, I mean, I do agree with Richard that you took a valid description here. I mean, here the description does become rather long, but if, if in the feeling of the chapter was more one of unfolding, sort of understanding of more and more and more of a particular point, I, I think you could do that by pairing back uh, and also adding that kind of a structure at the same time. On this point? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Anna Whittington. I just finished my PhD at Michigan. But one of the things that you set up in the beginning is that the, this chapter is an opportunity to also introduce the readers to Russia. And I don't think that you always accomplish that. And no, I wonder I if you could that. like actually focus on like painting a picture through the Tsar Tsarevich's journeys of what Russia actually was like at this time. And I think there's something that's maybe slightly missing insofar as it is about meeting the empire, but I think it's also an effort at capturing what Russia was as a whole and sort of understanding what that 
for a ruler to understand what this country looks like in all of its various complexities. Obviously, he doesn't go places, but that could also be somewhere. And I think one thing that I'll just say really quickly is that you have this great quote at the very end of the conclusion, right at the beginning, about how it's like a, the book is Russia, the book, but the book is animate, and it'll get itself to know its reader. This should actually really be at the front. And if you set that up, I think it sets up the chapter in a way that is like this dynamic process that I think I think it would give it a little more direction yeah, where yeah. No, yeah, that's one of those moments that could either go at the front or at the yes. end and I guess I was finishing so I put it at the end. <laughs> uh, I know, I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just jump in real quickly on that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean I was fascinated by the whole sort of way that this kind of plays into the whole Ruski and the, and, and uh, especially these sections where they're meeting the Inarotsi. You know, yeah. Clearly, they're, he's meeting Russians, but he's meeting people. All yeah. these people aren't Russians, yeah. and and the reactions they have, which are often very very visceral, and the and the sense of you know comfort and familiarity with coming home to what they see as being Russian. Yeah. So yeah. so it's like you have, and so it's a, it, it's an interesting moment because you have this this sense of of sort of Russianness, you know, with a small R playing out very much in the way they respond to the population, but yet there's also the big, you know, Russia playing out very strongly in the sense that, you know, this is this is the whole empire that they're, you know, Russia is a whole thing. You know, so, so if I'm understanding you correctly, and maybe uh, also, a Anna, you said, yeah? Uh, yeah? That also relating to your point about kind of well, you said Russia as a whole, and I added, I think, by way of glossing that, what, what does this all add up to, so to speak? Yeah, what is yeah. it that is Russia? What does it all add up to? Yeah. So you're talking about basically uh, the Russian the Russian nation and the Russian empire as being one sort of, that would be like for an example, like that would be an example mm -hmm. and of, of summarizing and saying basically, what does it add up to? Well, among other things, it's a, it adds up to this, uh, that there's uh, a, a portion of the country that basically represents the Russian nation that, uh, that a Russian national territory, if you will, that people uh, accompanying the, the the heir and he himself, they feel comfortable there. Uh, and then there's another portion that still is sort of alien and different. I mean, this kind of thing is that what you that, that what you're angling for? Sure, but I think that like there's a reason why he's got to do all of these parts of the travel at once, right? Yeah. There is like a sort of t taking a portrait that yeah. is taking mm -hmm. place on some level, like a freeze frame of yeah. like the country at a, at a moment, which I think really works for the idea of the book. Yeah. And I think you could do more with it. Okay. I, I read, I saw the same things, exactly the same things, but, but I had a different conclusion, which was that I, I really like it the way it is. Um, it could just be me, I, I don't know, but I, as a reader, and bearing in mind what your objective is, you want to give something which is uh, not too long, um, you want it to be a series of snapshots and entry points into views of, you know, the, the way you describe it. Um, and, and I read it, it was one of the few things I've read recently where I didn't want to put it down. I just, uh, I read it all the way through. And part of it was that the, there's the change in tempo and the change in optic in the middle of the chapter. And right around page 20, I think, it switches and it, it goes, it's, it, there's a key change. So the, the first part is I read it, I don't know if you intended it to be this way, but the first part was about the regularities of the empire. Um, the regularities of arriving at provincial abilities, arriving at trade and industry, arriving, there's the projection of power, there's the majesty, there's the ritual, and then the response, you know, what, what I, once, I think a lot of people have, have already commented on positively already. Um, so there's a certain regularity and repetitiveness which speaks of a certain kind of unity. And then in the second part, you switch gear and talk about the diversity, which is again, I think, what, uh, what Nathaniel's uh, talking about, if I understand yeah. you. And, and in that part, uh, suddenly we're, you know, uh, having gone through all these things that, you know, okay, so Kirov doesn't have a nobility, but, uh, but they have to make do with their merchantry, right? Yeah. There's still regularity here, and there's, yeah. this, we're talking about the estate system, plus religion, plus church, and all these things. And then the second part, you go to the diversity, and there we're given a different optic, which is that it's, you know, it is unified, and at the same time it's not, right? And, and it allows for difference, and there's a... Um, so I thought it worked very well, and I thought you know it needs you know touching up and pushing in certain areas in terms of what does it all mean, yeah. as opposed to adding layers and layers. The last thing that I'd want to see happen, I think it wouldn't be consistent with what you want to write, is to add chapters, add sections, add more research. You know, whereas what you have now is something really grabs, and what it could take, if if I'm understanding you, and if you mm -hmm. and, and if this makes sense to you, mm -hmm. is just a few sentences to alert the reader to the to the what it is you're doing in each part and in the mm -hmm. chapter as a whole. Uh, 
the part that I thought needed a little, just a little pushing, ultimately, you know, maybe read a couple of books, but then express in a couple of sentences, was in the second part where they're talking about diversity. Uh, what do they make of the diversity? Where, what kind of diversity we're talking about? And here I'm glad, you know, Nathaniel's here. Um, we have anthropologists in the room. Um, uh, you know, at that period in time, how could they understand diversity? What did it mean to them? Yeah. So the uninitiated reader will read it, and particularly if your readership is outside the Russian field, yeah. you say, oh, it's about race. And obviously it's not. Right? This is 1837. Yeah. This is Russia. Um, so alerting the reader that, you know, here's, you know, it's, it's a recognition of diversity, but what kind of diversity? What does it mean? What are they assuming? What are they bringing to it, right, in, in looking at it? Yeah. Um, so so my, my advice at this stage would be to just keep writing. Right, because it's, it seems to be going so nicely. I don't know, did, did you all find it a good read? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's important, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean as far as I'm concerned, that's, uh, I mean, uh, that's object number one, I mean, in my view. I mean, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe to respond, though, about, I mean, I, I had not thought about the chapter in exactly the way you described it. It was very interesting to hear you say that. I think, uh, how should I put it, there was a degree to which I think it was semi-conscious that as I found myself like writing these paragraphs, like here are these themes, and then I thought about how to sort of group them. And like for example, I, one section is called This is Russia. I was like, what, what else do I call it? I, what, I, how, what do I do here? And so that was just, a, it was a throwaway in some ways. But I, then I thought, okay, yeah, it kind of works. This is Russia, here it is. Um, but then I, I could tell that a lot of the diversity, but I hadn't thought about it in exactly those terms, like a portion of regularity and uniformity on the one hand, and diversity on the other. That could be an interesting way. I'd have to go back and look at it more closely, think, more about the extent to which, Im importantly, that actually does reflect and reveal uh, what, I've, what I've seen so far. You could have just said that's what you meant all along, right? Mm -hmm. No, 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 anybody else, right? Uh, Claim credit. Yes, but, but no, yeah. yes, but I'm <laughs> fundamentally honest yeah, yeah. Uh, and when I'm dealing with these things, in part because, uh, well, you're being honest, brutally so with me, because I'm not sure if that maybe you're holding back, maybe you're... Brutally? No, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is being brutally honest, but mm -hmm. in any event, people are being honest with me, right. maybe holding back and maybe walk out the door and say, what a bunch of rubbish, it's utter and complete crap. Like, no, I think why, actually... Why did I, I waste my Friday on this? But no, but, I mean, in all, but in all seriousness, I mean, uh, no, I'm trying to be honest in the sense that I think that w the point you're making is one that I think was partially realized, that I partially realized, but by no means fully. And to think about it in those terms, I think is useful. I do agree, I do agree fundamentally that I am, I am, well, I'm, I would be certainly nervous about breaking it up because I think uh, there's, uh, a structural logic, I think having one chapter, what I, what I could imagine doing, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how this would work. What I could imagine doing is trying to do something, and this is just has to do with the vagaries of, pub, of publication, of doing something with the air and these other travels in maybe a long article in some mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. My fear is that it would duplicate this too much and uh, anybody willing to publish it, or there wouldn't be anybody willing to publish it. They would say, you, you've already done this, really. But that would be, in some ways, the ideal scenario would be to have something, a long article, although it's already long, but a long article that would include all of the travels that we're talking about. Um, I, I, I'm open to the idea of, of lengthening it somewhat, I think, to the extent that um, it, it could be useful. I mean, realistically, if I do a lot of the things that people are saying, it's just out of control. I mean, I, I obviously have to make, I'm going to have to make dif difficult choices. But that's true. I do think as well, though, though that um, I mean, the way I approach the idea of cutting, for example, is, uh, you know, uh, axes and scalpel. I mean, you know, there's different ways you can cut. And I probably already put the axe to this. Um, in some ways, I think to decide how to use the scissors and scalpel, I think, for the purposes of reducing it somewhat, without losing anything substantial, depends on what the other chapters are going to look like in totality. In some ways, my inclination after this conversation would be maybe to you know, organize what you've said and probably just leave it, mm. not touch it until I can do more. But I do also think that, uh, and you, I mean, you can see this when you grade students' writing and you introduce like a topic sentence where there isn't one, um, uh, where you say, you know, in short, what? The, a few uh, strategically and well phrased, strategically placed and well phrased sentences Right. Can go miles right. in terms of making sense of otherwise, uh, of otherwise, uh, uh, not I would say incoherent, but only marginally coherent material. Okay, uh, I think I think you know. Obviously, you'll find something in between. But I think one thing that's very important is 
to give us sense of the driving ideas and culture surrounding this because uh -huh. it has uh, um, it's very well written it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to read uh, but you don't have a sense of, of, of meaning yeah. and, and context, context and so uh, Zhukov, Zhukovsky uh, who is a romantic and who yeah. was part of this uh, this movement uh, for, uh, for culture and uh, and uh, that uh, Maurice was talking about, uh, building uh, in one side of it, uh, Arsenev, uh, they were trying, I mean, there was, there was a motive there, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and was driving it. And you have to give, have a much greater sense, of, yeah. of course you can say, see the country, but it, they're supposed to be seeing the country in a certain, in certain way, way yes. I mean, yeah. not, not drills and uh, right. inspections and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So uh, I think I think you ha and, and I don't th think that would take long no. to develop. It, it, no. it, I, but I think at the beginning you you, you have to set the, the context a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I can, I can agree with that. I mean, I think uh, maybe that's something that I I have just haven't felt sufficiently confident <laughs> uh, yet at this point to be able to make those kinds of statements. And I think mm, to some degree. And I, you know, uh, Boris's point about, and I didn't really quite address that, but uh, the literary character of things, and I mean, really Anne addressed this as well, uh, and the idea of Pushkin as being a kind of thread that appears in, uh, here, and uh, Zhukovsky is actually a really big thread in a lot of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, he actually comments extensively. I don't think he witnessed, for example, the, the fire in the, uh, in the Winter Palace, but I think based on conversations with people who saw it, he actually writes an account of it. Mm -hmm. And there are other places where he, he comes up consistently. And so these kinds of, these particular figures, I think, will represent threads, and I'm hoping will also serve to reveal to a greater extent than what we have already, that element of driving ideas, as you say, the culture, the context, the meaning, the motives. But I agree that these have to be drawn out more. And that mean foreigners accounts can also be used to draw these out, or, or at least to reveal uh, the, the consequences and the reception of it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I have to I have to agree with that. But I think there's just a lot more I suppose reading that needs to be done. And I think the 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 particular ways or the particular elements of the context and the meaning and the motives that I want to identify, I think, will depend in no small measure on the central findings of these other chapters, mm -hmm. which I some of which I've written in part. But I think always in the context of, um, how should I put it, getting kind of the basic story down on the page uh, and maybe not yet having, uh, luxury is not the term, not, having yet ha not yet having the wherewithal, the distance, if you will, the critical distance to be able to think through what it actually means. And of course, this is the hardest part uh, mm -hmm. of the project. I mean, this writing this kind of thing is, uh, is the easy part in some ways, the fun part, mm -hmm. uh, to, to extract its larger meanings, but in, in some cases, I think we've all found this, at least in, in some instances, it can be like pulling hair in some cases, and in some cases, either through the help of friends and colleagues or just because you know, you're taking a shower and all of a sudden it, it hits you, uh, that's what this is about. I mean, that, or that's the way in which I can, I can articulate what, what the purpose, right. what, what the thing is. And I'm not, I'm not there yet, but this has given me a, a tremendous amount to, to think about, uh, a tremendous amount to um, a lot of ideas for thinking through these problems. A, I, the whole thing struck me as a performance, right? The, uh, Absolutely. On both, on both sides. You know, yes, like performing right. a certain notion of power and majesty. Yeah. Right? And the first part is, again, about you know, the regular ways in which power is performed. Yes. And the second part is the diverse ways in which power is performed. Yeah. Right? Um, could, could I, uh, could could I just make one point or two yeah. points about performance really, really quickly? Yeah. That's yeah. the theme of the ACS conference, right? And we'll attest. Performance. Right, and so I have a paper called "Performing Podansta." You actually followed it. <laughs> the, uh, I did. Uh, <laughs> I did actually, and I didn't. And I don't like alliteration, but I got it all the same. Uh, <laughs> performing Podansta, and I'll just mention that I'm going to try to do an experiment. I'm almost fearful. Should I say this? I'm going to try to deliver that paper in verse. 
And I figured no one else has ever done this wow. to try to do this. I have part of it written already. My wife says basically, sounds like Dr. Seuss. I said, well, that's great. That's what we're going for. We'll see if it works, but I figure this could be. And I'm not sure if basically, is this allowed? Is this allowed in the room? I just figure that basically, you know, do something different, see if it works. I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, it could be, and if people, I probably shouldn't have told you, but if people don't know about this, it could be an absolute, you know, it could be. It could be, it could be legendary. It could be awful. <laughs> but this is the joy of being, you know, like a tenured full professor. Yeah, yeah, you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can yeah. fail dismally. And people say, yeah, but he had that book though. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not quite so. Yeah, he's you know, <laughs> trash your reputation permanently. <laughs> so that's performance. Uh, what? You had another point on performance. Well, that's the other point on performance. That's the point. That I, it'll be about performing Podan's talk, and I will perform performing Podan's talk. <laughs> no, that, that's what I guess what I'm driving at. But I was, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. You were making another point. Oh, I was just talking about about push certain points but but again not expansively and not you yeah know, understood I, I think it's there but it just needs to be articulated here and there okay um, um, are you sure this conversation hasn't shifted to the mode where it requires alcohol to the what <laughs> <laughs> was it this, I think we're getting to a point where we need a drink to continue this conversation just <laughs> oh that was that was that was 12 minutes in <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, no, sorry, Yanni, go ahead. I'm just being very rude. We could. Uh, we should, you know, we're not there, I think. I don't know why we don't have alcohol at these things, but we don't. <laughs> I should ask. You know, the, no, uh, it'd probably be better. That it, would, it would, yeah, well, maybe not. For the speaker, probably you need to hold off. <laughs> at least a little while. Yeah. Well, there's some speakers who really require it. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think I do. Uh, no. Well, later, it's great to have, yeah. So, so in terms of, as I said, you know, so not writing more and therefore better, but writing, you know, carefully and uh, and therefore signaling to the reader where you're going and what it could mean. And so the, the one part that struck me, I think it was at the end of page 23, it's the end of the section, the end of the yeah, section. Yeah. And, and it yeah. said, and, and therefore he had seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Yeah. <laughs> And <laughs> okay, I, I'm with you, but yeah, no, you can no, do better. No, I you, can, yeah, you I can, in particular. Yeah, um, really meaning right. it's not just good, bad, and ugly. It's, it's you know <laughs> there's certain things that he understood. <laughs> You're laughing. Yeah. No, it's horrible. Yes, <laughs> you yeah. pointed it out. It's realize how lame it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, the time to say that. Yeah. This is what he thought he was seeing. This is what he's performing. This is yeah. what he's representing. Yeah. This is what he received in return. This is what the, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, along those lines, Richard, if I might ask, I mean, one source that I think you did consult that I have not seen, and that is the diary of uh, uh, of the heir, because mm -hmm. it, it's in Garf, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's a diary of this, and I'm just wondering. I mean, you've seen it. Do you, do you know the extent to which there are any major sort of revelations or themes or, 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 or prospects, or do the letters? I, I cite it in my. Dis uh, yeah. Extremely abbreviated uh, description of yeah. the trip, yeah. and but I don't know how much more there would be of, that would be of relevance to you. It yeah. wasn't a very long diary. I see. Uh, I look back at my notes. Yeah, I look. Yeah, I'd be my, curious to know because notes. I thought maybe you might say you you can't possibly write this without the diary. You must go and see that diary. I, I, I'll, I'll go. I'll go back yeah. to my notes. Okay. And see. I'd be very curious to know that yeah. because right. probably I ought to. But Joseph, let's see. Yeah, hi. I'm a PhD student in anthropology here yeah. at NYU. So I'm very much a kind of general reader approach this. Somebody works in Russia, but now. Great. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I was interested in the religious component of this trip yeah. and, okay. and, that, and the sort of meaning around that. Um, because it, I was intrigued when you said that you know, you're seeing this point as very much a, a, a point of rupture and breakthrough in Russian history. Mm -hmm. um, but you said something about not wanting to overstate that. Yeah. And I and I was wondering about how how what's being produced through this rather than performed uh, in terms of you know we talked about pastoral sort of this rapture, and it must be a kind of uh, uh, something of a religious experience for a lot of people, or at least an association, see, unless I'm wrong. And and in terms of thinking about the, the meaninglessness of these places, it's kind of bringing a certain meaning to them as well. And so, I it made me think about. Because you're, you're talking about these very modernizing classes like railways and, and sort of mapping and traveling is a kind of mapping, um, so sort of very kind of Benedict Anderson type processes. And yet, yeah. um, it also made me think of uh, Robert Orsi's book on uh, history and presence, mm -hmm. where he's thinking about how it's the modern, it's the railways, it's the it's the aeroplane, it's, it's the it's the media that actually allows for a kind of excess mm -hmm. of religious experience, which is hard to document. 
And you know, so just thinking kind of one, you know, it's not just the, the nationalities thing that interests me. Apologies, it's like you're saying religious behaviour is being performed. That's when I perhaps actually think, well, hang on a minute, it's probably a lot more meaningful than that. So how are you? And that's something like would, if you're saying you don't want to overstate the modernizing rupture pie, kind of that's that would be something that complicates that for me. So, yeah, and, and, I, and I was surprised how little of that was in the description. Uh, religious. Uh, I mean, and by religious you mean, how should I put it, literally religious and not simply uh, ecstasy as a kind of, as, a, as, as something that one could also experience in a religious sense, if I'm understanding you? I, I mean, for the, the people that would be, the, 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 the residents of these places that, that Sarah is yeah. visiting, um, that that would be part of this journey, that, that there's a, there is a kind of, um, religious experience being produced. Yeah, the experience. This, yeah, presence. Uh, no, that's very interesting. I hadn't. I mean, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. Uh, and yet, there's the rhetorical dimension to raptures and ecstasy and all the rest. Um, but the point was also made. Maybe Catherine, maybe you made it. I can't remember now. About how this doesn't necessarily mean that this isn't like sort of a genuine sort of experience. Mm -hmm. And I see no particular reason to doubt that there were elements, for, at least for some people, of really an intense, an, an intense experience. I mean, if one thinks about, I think of my, some, uh, myself as someone who is not particularly um, susceptible to um, uh, like cult of celebrity and this sort of thing. Uh, I had the opportunity last November, I went to a conference that happened to be in Rome and I happened to shake the hand of the Pope. And the problems for the church were not quite as deep then as they are now. Uh, and it was a striking, I mean, it's an absolutely amazing experience. Um, or Gorbachev came and spoke in Las Vegas, like back in uh, 2003 or something like that, and shook his hand. I mean, somebody who, like, a large portion of the world knows who this is. <laughs> Pope, same thing. Um, and uh, I guess I was struck by, I wouldn't overstate the case, but I was struck by what a profound effect it actually does have. And so I imagine then somebody living in these circumstances in Perm or Vyak or Orenburg, like having the opportunity, and I'm really, I'm developing, I think the point that, I, I think the point that you're making or that you're asking about, what a striking experience actually it was and could have been to many people. And it's maybe worth, maybe worth dwelling on that and, um, I mean, I tried to capture. I tried to capture it in these descriptions, and I suppose the descriptions are problematic in the sense that one doesn't know how much how much to ascribe to uh, uh, the rhetorical patterns of the day. To what extent, uh, of course, because they reacted in the first of Novgorod with such raptures, then we must too, and we must describe them in those fashions in that fashion as well. But some of the details of the descriptions to the extent that they're accurate, and of course we'll never know in, in most instances. I mean, they do really suggest, I mean, people uh, making every possible effort, you know, to see that, and why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they, it must, it, you know, and a lot of, you know, some of these accounts say, and, you know, the dreary life then basically continues as soon as it's gone, but you know, we're left with these extraordinary, these extraordinary memories, but it would be, it truly, you know, Varonaj, well, you know, 1837 is a year that will live forever, and, it, and we had, the, the, the heir to the throne and the empress. Uh, and actually that was before the whole family came through yet again later on. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of these places are crisscrossed and Moscow is visited more than once, say, for example. Uh, but even some of the smaller cities like Rizan, empress comes through and then the, then the heir comes through a week later. But what about, what about the uh, uh, visiting of church services? Did you feel that that was given any attention? Uh, in, uh, in the, um, that is the heir visiting, yeah, visiting yeah. Uh, in these accounts, I, I would say mo it seems most often it's just sort of treated as a kind of factual thing. You know, yeah, there they go to church that's my and feeling yeah, too, yeah, kind of it's. So the uh, the role of the church is not emphasized. Uh, no. I would I wouldn't say terribly. I think I think you know Filaret in Moscow might be something of an exception. Maybe some of those sites, but I think that has to do partly with well, partly with the status of Moscow for all of the reasons that you indicated. First mm. of all, and second of all, I think just um, the stature and rhetorical skill of Filaret himself as yeah. basically being a, a, a consummate speech maker and right. able to articulate meanings, I won't say the meaning because there's not one, meanings of these, mm -hmm. uh, of these things, but I would say in, in a large measure, 
uh, I mean, it's almost, it's a kind of, there's a taken for granted character of yeah, it. There, it also, on, I think it reflects the, 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 despite the official nationality and orthodoxy yeah, yeah. and such, uh, the, the secular character yeah. of the court culture uh, with this religious ideological overlay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking of, um, yeah, I'm just thinking of even that, just that account when the heir, um, you know, just describes the birthday ceremony for his father and just these sextons yelling at the top of their lungs, um, <laughs> just hitting whichever note. And again, one can imagine this, these people were going to make this good and they just go completely overboard and yeah. uh, are unable to control their voices. Uh, but it's not, yeah, it's not as though that bajestvanist and, uh, no, the, the, no the, I, it's, com it's not, not very much of that. You're, you're right, I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but in a lot of ways, there, and this may be linking these two points, yeah? is there's a, there is an element of religious experience, though not directly and literally religious, which is underscored by the comparatively, it seems, secular character of a lot of the activities <laughs> that are being described. And maybe that's what you were getting at in, in some ways. I'm not sure, yeah? yeah maybe the, the, the notion of sort of popular patriotism mm -hmm. as, as being a kind of quasi-religious you know, yeah. sensation, and, and, and you know, I think this is a kind of an interesting moment in yeah. terms, of, in terms yeah. of the the motives for people to be emotionally moved yeah. by this by this event. And uh, you know, you can imagine how someone in the province, you know, seeing the the air means feeling connected, you know, feeling connected to some kind of larger whole and all of other peoples around the empire, Absolutely. which which creates this sense of, of of meaning and belonging and and a, a kind of richness of life. You know, it's, it's sort of like the, the chapter of Benedict Anderson's book that he never got around to writing. You know, but but I think these sort of the, the ways that people on the ground respond to, to these larger power yeah. to, to feel this sense of sense of connection. So I, I mean, I think there's an element of, of kind of nation building in, in these expressions of, of popular patriotism, yeah. which is, yeah. you know, which is, which is another, you know, sort of turn that is happening around this time that I think you could... Absolutely, and I would, could imagine, uh, I hadn't thought about it in exactly those terms, or I hadn't thought about this particular ep episode in relation to that issue, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But in its appropriate place, and I haven't, it depends on the order of the chapters, I mean, um, the idea of an emerging national sort of consciousness, um, although one can trace it back earlier, but I mean, I think in the ways that you're describing, I think I, I would be able to gesture back to this chapter in appropriate places and therefore would need to maybe articulate those a little bit more clearly in the version here so that those connections become clear when they're made subsequently. I mean, maybe that's what I'll offer in response now. But I think that's right. Um, definitely worth thinking about. Could I ask you a little bit about Russophobia, the chapter on Russophobia? Yeah. Because it's an awkward time to be writing that chapter just now. Well, it's uh, a great time. What? It's a great time. <laughs> I agree. It's I agree. Did you want to give us a little hint about where, how you're going to handle that one? Uh, well, all right. So um, one, of the one of the reactions that the readers had, at that point I had no, there was no foreign policy component to the proposed book. And that was pointed out to me, and I thought, hmm, that is really quite interesting, and that's, uh, that's important. And I had, there's, there, was a, there was an uprising, uh, the Kasimov uprising in, in the Kazakh steppe in 1837. I knew virtually nothing about it, but I put it into the book proposal, because I knew it happened in 1837. And it turns out that it doesn't really work very well, and it, uh, it occurred to me, I was, had the opportunity, I was in Kazakhstan for a couple of weeks in November, I just did a lot of reading around, I knew that that winter, campaign that occurred in 1839 to 40, and I was kind of curious about the run-up to that. Uh, you know, what, what were the problems, and, um, and there are a lot of things going on, but at least uh, ostensibly the justification for, for attacking the Khanate was that um, its dependents, which were mostly Turkmen and a, a certain clan of, of uh, the uh, Adayevtse, they were called, of the Kazakhs, they were taking hostages on the Caspian Sea, fishermen, and then people off the kind of the Orenburg line and that area. And they were being held in captivity, and this was sort of unacceptable, and there were attempts to discipline the Khanate. And one of the ways they did this actually was quite interesting that happened in 1836, was that they simply rounded up the, uh, all the uh, heathen traders who were in Orenburg and Astrakhan, they just basically tossed them and essentially into prison, confiscated their goods. And the idea was that this would then compel the Khanate to, um, to release the Ru Russian captives. 
Um, that didn't work, and in the aftermath of that, the decision was made then to engage in the, uh, in the attack. And I have different accounts exactly when that began, but one eyewitness describes it as based, beginning precisely in 1837, where they start to prepare, they start to bake lots of bread, and uh, they take vegetables and they dry them, and they start collecting, it's a huge operation, and they start gathering camels, uh, the Cossacks are saying, you're crazy to do this in winter. They were, of course, right. Um, it was done anyway, and it was a terrible disaster. And so what I thought I could do with that chapter, and I, this has been written in draft, was to take that and then to try to relate it to the ways in which... Uh, I, I desperately don't want to reduce that episode to this kind of great game uh, framework. And people have sort of written against that. I think there's a tendency in the historiography of Central Asia to write against that now. But to ignore it completely also is impossible because you can really sense that there is this tremendous rise in British Russophobia that appears over the course of uh, the 1830s and really culminates in 1837 to 38. And I mentioned the trip of the heir to London in 18, late 1838 or 39, I can't remember, which is part of the process of re repairing uh, the relations after that. There's this moment when uh, these uh, strongly Russophobic British figures who are writing all kinds of pamphlets uh, against Russia, they try to force this, um, this ship, the Vixen, against an embargo that the Russians have established over the entire eastern coast of the Black Sea. Um, they're still fighting, of course, the, the war in the Caucasus and the, you know, the North Caucasus, and the British are not yet willing to recognize Russian claims to this territory. So the long and short is what I try to do is to describe the situation leading up to the attack in 1839, and then shift for basically just a section to describe the elaboration, and I rely heavily on this book that was written back in 1951 by this guy Gleason, I can't remember his first name now. Abbott? No. Not Abbott Gleason, it's a different, it's an English Gleason, 1951. Oh, 1951. Yeah, and it's called The, the Genesis of Russian, uh, British Russophobia, and uh, Faith has seen it too. I'm not sure what you think about that book. I read it and thought it was wonderful. I just thought it was really interesting. I don't think he was Russian, but he just, he provides this account of, well, I mean, that, that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to describe British Russophobia. And I just thought this was a terribly, in, I, I thought to, in light of the fact that a reviewer had said foreign policy is not present here, and I had to, you know, I had to nod my head and say, yes, it's, yes, it's true. And in light of the fact that it could be linked, I think the British are reacting more to the situation in the Ottoman Empire, Unkar Skalesi, uh, and Persia in particular. But as a, another, you know, there's this arc of territory, actually there's an arc extending all the way from Scandinavia all the way out, arguably even to China, but certainly well into Central Asia. There's an arc of activity involving those two countries that the British and uh, the British are reacting to this, and so I thought to situate the actions of Russia in relation to the step where those actions are dictated primarily, it seems to me, by concerns about the step, about security, about imperial prestige, about uh, the outrageous behavior of the Khanate, and so forth and so on, that this needed to be situated in some sort of larger international or geopolitical context, for which you know, a seven-page section will serve its purpose. So the idea is to put that, that uh, chapter is provisionally called Unruly Khanate and Cold War 1.0. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea being that in some ways this really is the first Cold War, and I don't know, Faith, I know you're working maybe generally speaking in this area. Well, on the other end, it's, it's interesting because the Polish question is also tied up. It with is, that. it is, But it's Absolutely. interesting now that I'm thinking about it because I just wrote a, a chapter about this and it's, you know, the British have been very, the British and the French and everyone have been very supportive of the, of the Poles coming, but it's exactly in 1837-38 that the British start becoming more anxious about Poles as potential revolutionaries and all this stuff. How curious, so that Which I didn't Which is likely realize. tied to this visit and that you're describing. It, it, I'm sorry, it is or it isn't? It, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is, yeah. okay. I hadn't thought about it that way. It's yeah. interesting. I mean, that's one, I, I, I mean, Gleason mentions the polls as one, uh, as one and actually in some, ways the, in some ways the missing sort of conflict, it might have been possibly even better to have discussed precisely the, the Caucasus War, yeah. maybe even more so than the war, than the situation in, uh, in Central Asia. Uh, simply because it's unfolding, I mean, uh, doesn't Shamil sort of become the principal figure precisely around 1835? It's right in this, in this moment, and I feel sort of uh, aggravated in having to skip, uh, skip across that. I acknowledge it, of course. It's part of, it's part of the development. I mean, the, the, the British Russophobes, as Gleason describes it, they regard the, the peoples of the North Caucasus as, you know, holding the keys to human liberty and freedom. I mean, they sort of greatly exaggerate their significance, uh, because precisely it's, it's a stick with which to beat Russia, and it's used uh, energetically. 
But I guess thinking, I guess maybe thinking more about long-term consequences and thinking about this first push into Central Asia, aside, of course, from the first attempt undertaken by, once again, Peter the Great in 1716 to 17 against Hiva, that this, that this future, this, I mean, the beginning of the real conquest of Central Asia, I think that this is it. That first attempt is unsuccessful, but the second attempt to take Ahmasjid in 1853 by Perovsky, the Ahmasjid, I think, being renamed Perovsk, as I recall, uh, that this kind of re creates a kind of lineage, if you will, for the book that situates the great kind of Asian future for Russia more successfully, it seems to me, than the war in the Caucasus. That's a long answer to your question about British phobia. No, no. British Russophobia, I just realized now. I, I can see how Pushkin and Ezerum would fit into it. You know, the journey to Ezerum and his diary of the... Uh, Correct. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah right. yes, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the, that was the sort of the basic uh, idea there. And to, and to read, you know, just the opportunity to read some of these uh, these, these British pamphlets. I mean, they're just a scream. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to read this stuff. Uh, and I mean, this is it's just a, uh, a reading a, a lot of the materials. I mean, probably Susan will agree. I think maybe all of the people who worked in this era, I mean, the, in the, the provincial newspapers in particular, uh, I mean, it's just so, so amusing yeah. to read, you know, I mean, when people think like, okay, what's newsworthy? Uh, I start with a story about a pig who gives birth to puppies. It's called an extraordinary occurrence in nature. I'm like, who can argue? With it? An extraordinary occurrence. How did this happen? But you start with which chapter? With the chapter on the newspaper. On the newspaper. You know, most people would consider it impossible that a pig would give birth to puppies. But this is exactly what happened in Mogilo, uh, Madigo <laughs> province in 1839. And thanks to the provincial newspapers, inquiring minds even now can know about. This. Yeah, inquiring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> The so, provincial inquirer. Yeah, and, no, that's yeah. exactly right. And so the, it's uh, there's that um, uh, the language of the time and the, and the British that just their over the top rhetoric uh, is just really quite striking in it. Mm -hmm. But it, they're they're just extraordinary artifacts of that you know particular historical historical moment. So uh, that was it was partly to get I had I felt like I had to get a, a foreign policy angle in there, and I thought that not to refer to to some degree to that reaction. I mean, a lot of ways, this could have been two separate chapters, but this is just to say, to make a point in some ways that could be made. I mean, you know, it, this is the 25th anniversary of the War of 1812. I'm surprised that I haven't seen more material on this. Mm. Uh, it, that's the, one of the reasons why the heir goes to Smolensk, is that he visits all these places. And as I recall, he receives Borodino as a gift on his birthday, right. or his name day, right. uh, in that year. He receives what? The, the village of Buddy. Here it is, it's yours. Uh, but you know, there's a description of, of, of visiting the sites, and there's some old timers basically who are there. Some, uh, oh, I guess I describe it here, yeah. Um, uh, but there are other things that you know one could talk about. The um, uh, the great staircase in Odessa was that construction began on that in 1837. As it hmm. turns out, just by chance, there are other things that one could one could write about. They, it, depending on how one counts, I'd originally wanted to have the beginning of the uh, construction of the Christ the Savior Cathedral, which, um, but there are different starting points. It's hard to tell where that, it's yeah, really hard to tell where that starts. Yeah. The cornerstone is laid in 1839, uh -huh. uh, but the, uh, the monastery, the convent that was there before yeah. is cleared out in 1837. But I was just thinking in terms of the light, so I'm thinking I might not reintroduce that, and it makes a very interesting contrast that construction project and the reconstruction of the Winter Palace, the one taking 50 years and the one taking 15 months. It's a really striking yes. uh, contrast, and it speaks to the, I guess, comparative importance of reconstructing that palace as quickly as possible. It's like an absolute, it appears to be an absolute priority. But that I think I have to include simply because very few people know this. That I didn't know this. How many people, can I just ask, how many here knew that the Winter Palace burned down in 1837? Right. Well, I know. You know. Yeah, I guess a few people, but I didn't know. I, you, this was my wife. She said, you want to do 1837? You should do the palace as well. By the way, oh, really? uh, it is a book that um, uh, is Susan Morrissey uh, is coming out with on uh, the Winter Palace. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I, I, I know, yeah, not Susan Morrissey, I, I, it's, um, the name, uh, it's, I know you're talking about, uh, I, yeah. I got the names mixed up. Yeah, Susan I, McCaffrey. McCaffrey, yes. Yeah. 
and uh, she has a whole chapter on the uh, oh no on the on the fire oh no uh, yeah. uh, I, I've been meaning to write to her and I had a feeling it's that coming she might... it's coming out soon All because right. I gave it a, a, a blurb okay yeah. uh, they All asked right. for one I I I read it at an earlier stage and at a later stage with yeah. it was much better. Yeah. And, uh, All right, here I was hoping that it was going to take her some time. I, I, I was meaning to contact her and mm -hmm. ask her about this, and I've never gotten around to doing it. Uh, well, so be it then. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you, you'll want to look at that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what the, about this project is I have no problem saying He's that... He's using secondary. Yeah, and the vast majority... Well, well, the more it's, the better, it's, yeah. It's a, it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what's... Disconcerting is I already wrote, wrote that chapter in draft at least, but then you know I mean I'll just insert it and in. there's always a staircase in Odessa. Right? Yeah, there's always a staircase in Odessa. There's always something else, yeah, to write about. But I mean, but this is that's good to know. I assume that she probably would have touched on that. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's particularly good on the matters connected with construction. Okay. Things like that. Like structural yeah. structural engineering and these sorts of things. Yeah, she's a good. Yeah. Really good. Great. All right. Well, we'll compare on that. I'll probably write to her soon then. It just, it just goes to show that any time you think you come up with something great, somebody's already... We talked about this, Catherine, didn't we? Yeah. I think you have a great idea and somebody you find out... Always find out that basically somebody's five years ahead of you. Uh, always five years. But you found out now. Yeah, but I found out now. No, but this is great. In fact, I have... I, I mean, in some ways it's a slight disappointment, but actually in some ways it's better. Yep. Because it means that the, I'll get the story as right as it can be. Right. When it's actually yeah. done, because it'll be based on someone who's probably studied it at oh, considerably, studied it very, yeah, yeah very. considerably greater length than I did. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, all right. Thanks for coming to us. Well, oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, very useful. Yeah. We all wish you well. I think comrades were in favor of the report uh, from uh, Comrade Worth. But yeah. come again if you have another chapter to present. All right. All right. Yeah. We can start right now, but uh, maybe not. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you.